This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. Hello and welcome to the next episode of uh, Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Uh, we'll be looking at the Gospel of John chapter 14 in this video. So I'm sorry it's took me quite a long time to release this. It's just took me so long to build the material for this uh, chapter because it's a very difficult uh, part of the Bible, I think. Uh, there's a lot of difficult themes to unpack here. And it's certainly a passage that people uh, certainly struggle with. So um, it's going to be quite a long study. You might not want to watch this uh, all in one sitting. Uh, so do refer to the video description for the schedule and all the, the chapters. And do excuse me as well, because I've got a bit of a groggy voice while recording this today. So this in this study, this is going to be a very complex study because of the face value of what we will read in this chapter that seems to be counterintuitive uh, given what we have read in John's Gospel so far in this series. So earlier in the series, well, John 6 and uh, John 10 that we looked at are passages we typically use to justify eternal security. John 15 is a passage used to justify conditional security and chapters 14 and 15 are also used to justify a works-based salvation. Whereas up to now we've frequently seen belief or faith as the action required for eternal life. Uh, first I will deal with, so, so what I'm going to do, um, I wanted to cover chapters 14 through to 16 in one sitting just because it, it's one long conversation and really it does carry on from John 13 but it's a very difficult part of the Bible there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot where you really do have to go to other parts of the Bible to explain it because it's quite difficult to understand what Jesus is talking about so what I'm going to do is in this study first I will deal with non-Holy Spirit related issues in these chapters so like keep my commandments abide in me and then once I've gone through John 14 15 and 16 I'll then probably do a separate study on the Holy Spirit specifically and just revisit all three chapters so the the conversation or the context if you like of John 14 continues the same conversation where we left off from John 13 and we'll carry on to John 16 as one long conversation. So we, we can see these chapters as one long conversation. Um, so do make sure that you view all study videos in sequential order so that the train of thought makes sense. So it might be more, may, might make more sense to watch my video on John 13 first if you haven't seen it yet. Okay. So although I am only going to do John 14, just because otherwise the video would be ridiculously long, um, just summarizing all chapters here. Uh, John 14 to 16 is a very complex passage. It contains themes which are very difficult to understand. A lot, of, a lot of similar themes from these chapters are echoed by John in his first epistle and then to a lesser extent his second epistle, which is also a very a difficult book to understand, especially uh, particularly in relation to eternal life. So um, a lot of verses uh, in these passages have double meanings. There's an immediate application to the disciples who are the, the direct audience of Jesus' dialogue but then there's the extended application to us as believers um, otherwise it may be difficult to know whether he's referring to his disciples specifically or all believers generally uh, the passage doesn't really mention eternal life directly as a repetitive theme but there are many themes in this passage which typically christians typically associate with having eternal life such as knowing jesus and knowing the father Jesus abiding in and manifesting himself to us and then believing in the intertwined relationship between the Son and the Father. So he does, although he doesn't mention eternal life, a lot of Christians would equate those things as part of the eternal life package. Um, even Jesus' own disciples didn't under, understand a lot of what Jesus was talking about in these chapters. So if they struggled to understand it then, when they hung around with Jesus all the time, they'd been with him for so many years, and they were right there with him and they could ask questions that we can't ask, well, obviously we're going to certainly struggle with this passage as well. Um, but at least at least we have the hindsight that they did not have at that full um, you know, we've seen what happened to Jesus after this time. Uh, we have the epistles to further build on these foundations. Another reason why this is a very hard passage to understand is that Jesus often speaks here with a sense of finality, as if it's kind of the last time he sees his disciples and he will leave them. Yet 
eventually he will actually rise again and see them very shortly after. And so this has potential to become rather cryptic and confusing for us then. Um, why does he speak to his disciples with such finality when they will see him again in only a few days? When he speaks of coming again, does, does he mean when he resurrects to the disciples or does he mean that the second coming, including all believers, right? And alongside this finality, Jesus appears to bounce back and forth between subjects and repeat things. So it's not always clear how intertwined and related his statements are. So it's a very, you know, difficult passage, difficult chapter that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, because of the uh, contrary teachings that are out there that use this passage as one of their key proof texts, and, and because I have so uh, vehemently, you know, proclaimed eternal security and faith alone up to this point in the series, we do need to be very careful about how we handle this passage. We, d we don't want to butcher it to try and bend it to say in into what into saying what we think it ought to say or what we want it to say. Uh, we have to be careful that we can answer it diligently and accurately, and to be proven with hard questions when confronted about this passage. And we can't just dismiss this passage as not being about losing our salvation, although that's, you know, more John 15, without actually proving and justifying why. Uh, we, we can't just use dismissive and lazy answers such as, you know, it's not about salvation, it's about discipleship, and then, and then you know, terminate any further discussion on the matter, unless we can unequivocally prove this to be the case. Uh, we need to understand and examine the language very closely and understand the key points that Jesus is actually teaching in these chapters. So in this study, we, we will have to digress from, uh, sorry, I've put John 14, 16, John 14, uh, several times because the, there are wider biblical things we need to understand so that we can grasp what's going on here holistically uh, to understand some of the things that Jesus is talking about in these chapters. So up to this point in the series, I've tried to keep things fairly simple, but this study is going to be more complicated than things I've previously discussed for the simple reason that it's a very difficult passage to understand, okay? I'll try to explain it as, as simple as possible. Uh, you know, please do take breaks and think about some of the things and come back to the video if you need to. Uh, refer to the schedule that I'll pop in the description. Um, so as I said earlier, ideally chapters 14 through to 16 should be combined into one study, but because it's such a long conversation, uh, you know, there's so much to address here and one study video would just be far too long for one sitting. So I'm just going to have to do it one chapter at a time as I have been doing in the, in the series most of the time. So in this study, we're going to, we're going to focus on John 14. So hopefully you did already watch my video on John 13 to get, get some of the, the train of thought, but recalling what we studied will help us to understand the background of this conversation leading into chapter 14. So remember that the, the disciples do not fully grasp what Jesus is about to go and do this. They're still lacking a confident faith in everything that Jesus has spoken to them. Peter and the other disciples said that they would die with Jesus and not deny him, but we know that they won't follow this through. Despite this, Jesus said to Peter, you shall follow me afterwards. So Jesus is aware of their false face of confidence, if you like, but he has other plans for the disciples. Jesus is going to his death, then uh, see the disciples for a short time when he resurrects. But after this, they will be without him. So he's going to leave them the Holy Ghost in his place. And he also commands the disciples to, to love one another as I have loved you. Okay, so this all sets the context for what John 14 through to 16 is talking about, because it's really a, a continuation of this dialogue. Sorry, it's been over eight minutes and I'm still babbling, but uh, there's just some important disclaimers that we, we need to be aware of before we read these passages, you know, so that we don't run to this passage at the expense of clearer teaching. So disclaimer number one, Jesus is speaking to his own disciples, not ordinary believers, uh, certainly not unbelievers. So that these are the 11 that followed Jesus all the way through his ministry. Since they were recruited, they did not abandon him as the other disciples back in John 6. Excuse me, they're not ordinary believers that just had a couple of encounters with Jesus. They're not the publicans and harlots on the outside. They're not the Jews that stumbled in unbelief. It's his closest disciples. So naturally, these chapters are harder to understand than most because there is a target audience for these statements and teachings. And the disciples had the luxury of being first-hand witnesses to everything Jesus said and did, which we do not. So, you know, very, very difficult passage to understand. Um, Jesus, disclaimer number two is that Jesus alludes to eternal life, but he does not speak overwhelmingly about the subject as the key purpose of what he's talking about. Now, the word life only appears twice, 
with one of those instances re- referring to Jesus laying down his own life, not not the giving of eternal life per se. And uh, most of the common salvation keywords that we think of do not appear in this conversation. So the word eternal or everlasting, never mentioned. Justified or justification, never mentioned. Repent or repentance, never mentioned. Saved salvation, never mentioned. Faith, never mentioned. Uh, the closest salvation keywords that we have in this conversation are righteousness, two mentions in chapter 16, but only in the context of the world rejecting Jesus, not, not in the context of believers who accept Jesus. And then we have believer, and this word is more abundantly mentioned, and, that, but, and very often it is addressed to the disciples themselves, it's not talking about unbelievers. However, if you look at the reasons why Jesus says to believe in him, he, he does not state this time that obtaining eternal life is the reason for believing him. He did in previous chapters in John, but not in this section. The reason that he says to believe in him in this conversation is for the in, understanding the interchangeability of the Father and the Son, uh, and there's the chapters and verse numbers cited there for you doing greater works in his name and of course we know from paul's writings that righteousness unto salvation is without works okay that's uh, frequently in romans and galatians and it's, again i've said this earlier but it's important to understand the disciples uh, do not fully understand what's going on here so that the whole point of jesus saying to believe in him is that the disciples would fully understand and have complete trust in everything jesus is about to accomplish after this event okay so because of the these well i say this reason these reasons we, we should be very suspicious of somebody who tries to use statements from john 14 to, and 15 as prerequisites for obtaining salvation unto eternal life when Jesus is speaking to his closest disciples, not even ordinary believers for that matter. Uh, he's not speaking overwhelmingly about eternal life as the key purpose of what he is even talking about. And the disciples have already declared, we, we've seen earlier in this study before this, that they are sure that Jesus is the Christ. They will even confirm in chapter 1630 that, that they believe and understand that Jesus came from God. But there's still some things that they're not fully grasped what Jesus has to to help them with. So when we have clear passages about eternal life specifically, where Jesus is advising people to believe in him, we should be very suspicious of someone with a works-based salvation trying to use these chapters here to make other passages in the Bible of no effect when getting saved it is not even really the purpose of what Jesus is even talking about here. Okay. That being said, that there are certainly sections of this passage that appear to be salvation relevant at least if we were to look at their face value without looking more carefully so important questions must be considered if a man does not abide in me uh, sorry jesus said if a man does not abide in me he is cast forth as a branch into the fire well if that's not hellfire then what is it superficially it sounds like hellfire it's very strong language if it doesn't mean hellfire but that's john 15 so that will have to wait to the next study i'm afraid but in, in chapter 14 though where jesus will say he that has my commandments and keeps them loves me and knows me so it, it then raises the question can we really be saved quote unquote if, if we don't love god or, or don't know god um, how can we believe in him if we don't know him and surely obeying his commandment is a part of knowing him according to this chapter which is a theme that john picks up on in his epistle as well echoing a lot of the same themes from this conversation really and so even if the passage is not explicitly about getting saved the, these factors cannot be completely ignored and we can't just get away with using a lazy answer such as just saying well it's about salvation it's not about discipleship full stop and then not actually going to john 14 to prove that that's even the case now you know holistically i can think that that's a good case but you know we, don't, we need to make sure that we can explain it properly using the, the words that jesus actually gives us in this passage but because of these things, as, as I go through the, the next few chapters in the next videos in this series, I'll, I'll do my best to answer the passages as if they are talking about salvation, as well as answering from the perspective that we're not. So we'll, we'll cover sort of both perspectives, hopefully, leaving no stone unturned. So, you know, for example, when we do a study on John 15, we'll consider various interpretations of abiding in the vine and shortcomings and arguments for each interpretation um, but again that'll be more to do with john 15 i did all these i did a lot of these notes before i actually decided i'm going to have to do one chapter only uh, so at the end of this study i hope that you'll realize that this passage does not contradict other passages at all it, it establishes everything that we've been discovering so far throughout this study series uh, and you will have a better understanding of why jesus is saying these things so uh, spoiler alert i will argue that the overall purpose of this conversation in john 14 16 is not to tell the disciples how to get saved and keep their salvation 
quote unquote, but rather it's about having full confidence in their faith in who Christ is and what he is about to accomplish and then continuing in that faith, not departing from the path that Christ has taught them. Okay, so that's kind of a spoiler, but that's, you know, what I'm going to kind of reach uh, to a conclusion. So um, I don't normally do things like this, but for the study, I came up with what I would call uh, the four C's of, of John 14 to 16, if you like. So we, we have confidence. Now, that word is not used verbatim in, in John 14 16, but the disciples have faith in Christ, but it's perhaps not a fully confident faith. Uh, full assurance in Christ has not been realised. Jesus needs to solidify their confidence in who he is and what he will accomplish. Uh, continue, so continue in or abide in the truth, the foundation that Christ has laid. Do not drift away from this truth. Remain in this truth. Never depart from it and be not discouraged from it. Comfort, so uh, Christ will depart and ascend into heaven. We cannot see him now, but in his place he will send the Holy Spirit to be a comforter. The disciples and believers will need this comfort if they are to continue and have confidence in Christ. And also to keep Christ's commandments, which is the final word. Remember what Christ has taught and continue to teach it and to practice it. And as brethren, love one another as Christ has loved you. Okay? But we, are, we are nearly on the study, forgive me for rambling, but just one more thing to say is that furthermore, a lot of people with a workspace salvation use John 14 to 16 as, as some kind of dangerous warning to believers that at any moment you could, you know, make the wrong choice and walk away from your salvation. This discourages the faith uh, of many. And I find this very ca counterintuitive because I, I would actually argue that when we look at the language that Jesus uses, the whole point of John 14 to 16 is supposed to be an encouragement, okay, not a warning or rebuke. This passage is not warning believers that at any given moment you could just fall away from the faith and lose salvation, so, you know, start shaking in terror. Rather, actually, it's an exhortation by Christ to his disciples that even though he will leave them and, and hand over the baton to the disciples, so to speak, everything's going to be okay. I'll leave you with the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Trust me, continue in that trust with an unwavering faith and just as I have loved you with an unwavering faith even though that I know that you will forsake me at the death be emboldened by what I am about to accomplish at Calgary stay united love one another with that same unwavering love and I believe that that's really a good summary of what Christ is actually intending to to say throughout these chapters so uh, as we read what Jesus tells his disciples even though he knows that they are going to forsake him after this even though they are doubtful and not grasping some of the things that he was told them over and over again he still uses positive encouraging language throughout these chapters okay so you know john 14 16 is supposed to encourage the disciples not not rebuke them not what it's, it's an encouragement and so really it ought to encourage us too and hopefully this will become more noticeably apparent as the study progresses okay that it will just be obvious that you know this is not some sheer hellfire damnation warning it is an encouragement. That's the purpose of Jesus having this conversation with his disciples. Without further ado, let's get into our study. So we'll start from verse 1 through to verse 9. So, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet uh, you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how do you say then, show us the Father? Now remember what I just said to you, okay? Don't, you know, this is an encouragement. Jesus opens up with an encouragement. Let not your heart be troubled. So he's reaffirming his relationship with God the Father that the disciples have overheard him saying to the Jews many times before, okay? It, go, it goes without saying that the disciples believe in God, but perhaps their belief or their faith in the Son is somewhat wavering, which uh, we already had signs of in John chapter 13 in our previous study. So when Jesus says, believe in me, in this passage, it's not so much about how to gain eternal life, because uh, 
unlike previous chapters when Jesus was dealing with unbelieving Jews, he's not repeating eternal life as the goal of believing in him in this dialogue. Rather, it's about solidifying their confidence in their faith or in their belief, if you like, that the completion of their faith by, by fully realising what Jesus will what he's about to go and do and therefore the continuation of their faith and the hope of the sending of the comforter in jesus's place jesus's statements in verses two while four are somewhat cryptic because uh when he says i go to prepare a place for you you know i will come in what 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 exactly does he mean because there are different ways that you could look at this does he mean i'm going to heaven shortly after my death to prepare a place for you and i will come again at my resurrection uh, this view is objectionable because there are some scriptures that indicate that Jesus went to Hades during the three days, but we won't we won't explore that question in this video. Um, after my resurrection, I will prepare a place. Or does he mean, sorry, I, I will prepare a place for you after my resurrection in heaven and I will come again at the second coming? Or does he mean that by what I am about to do in doing so, it will prepare a place in heaven for you and for all those that believe? And I will come again by resurrecting to you as my disciples and at the second coming for all believes that that's kind of a double meaning if you like or does he mean something else entirely so you know it's a little bit of a cryptic uh, thing to understand there um for several reasons it's not entirely clear whether jesus means specifically about his disciples or all believers uh jesus did come again so to speak to, to the disciples and many witnesses but then this doesn't apply to us as believers after that time in the, in that context anyway uh, however we define come again the resurrection of the second coming will further challenge to understand by what he means i receive you unto myself that where i am you you may also be again quite quite a difficult saying to understand there whichever interpretation we take and how exactly does jesus go to prepare a place for you what what does this mean and, and how does it apply because this is a cryptic passage this is why uh, this passage is very hard to understand and so it's important to understand that much of what i will say about this subject may, may so well these verses in particular anyway may be subject to my opinion and, and i may be wrong it's a very difficult passage to understand and as we see with philip his own disciples didn't really fully understand what he was talking about but for the same reason because it's quite cryptic and difficult to understand we should be very careful about what salvation doctrines we pluck out from this chapter because fal false prophets love chapters like this and they love to quote mine the later verse which will say if you love me keep my commandments um you know because it's very easy to uh, misguide people if you can use cryptic chapters that are very hard to understand otherwise uh but we should be we should be very careful about building our doctrine on issues on something as important on salvation as something that's a very cryptic passage very difficult passage to understand and very targeted to a very selected audience even from jesus's perspective okay later in this same chapter verses 28 through to 25 will help us to understand what more, more clearly what jesus might may mean and also in, in chapter 16 verses 27 to 28 so he goes on to say these things have i spoken to you being yet present within you he goes on to say peace i leave with you peace i give unto you um I, you have heard that i say unto you i go and away and come again unto you if you love me you would rejoice because i go unto the father i came forth from the father lately sorry uh, later in john 16 he'll go he'll go on to say i came forth from the father and i'm coming into the world again i leave the world and go to the father so technically speaking we obviously know in hindsight that jesus will see the disciples before he ascends into heaven to be with the father despite this though the language that jesus is using in these chapters appears to have a sense of finality okay he, he's talking to the disciples here as if he won't see them again straight away after his ascension okay uh, unless you interpret that to be the meaning of come again um but I, you know if he's going to the father and everything it, it seems to be a degree of finality that 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 doesn't necessarily apply in a resurrection context now contextually uh this sounds very confusing but if we can understand how the resurrection ties in with this dialogue it, it may help us to understand why jesus is talking like this okay now sometimes you know as human beings we're, we're being carnally minded we we try to separate the resurrection from the dead because we're we're very time bound 
in how we view the Bible. So we say, first this happened, Jesus speaks to his disciples, if you will leave the world and not see them again. Then this happened, Jesus died on the cross and was buried. And then this happened, Jesus rose again and saw the disciples again. And then this happened, Jesus ended leaving the world to be with the Father. So the order of events where he, uh, you know, seems to be a little bit confusing when we look at it like that, because it seems like he's coming again in that context, even though he descends to his father afterwards, which seems to be the inverse of, of what we saw previously. But if, if we understand the timelessness and the eternal nature of Christ, I think this might make more sense to you. Um, once we can realise this, we, we can understand how the death and, and the burial and resurrection and ascension can be seen as one combined event rather than trying to sort of break it up into separate events that that completes everything that jesus is saying in john 14 through to 16. so although these scriptures below are not all about the resurrection specifically they they do give us indication about the eternal nature of christ that even before he went to the cross everything he is about to go and do in eternity already happened but it's it's just being manifest in earthly terms after the conversation of john 14 16 so you've got like you know the the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world you've got foreordained before the foundation of the world but manifest in these last times um, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world uh, then must he often have suffered since since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world he has appeared to put away sin um, and then i am the resurrection which is in the present tense not the future tense even though that happened in the past from from this point so um we see then that given the eternal nature of christ everything he is about to go and do has has really already been done in eternity it, it already happened from the foundation of the world long before it actually happened chronologically here so that's how you know if you've ever wondered old testament believers were able to go to heaven but as far as the disciples were concerned this is only just about to be manifest and so the next thing we will see is how jesus speaks with finality and how, how he will interact with his disciples after his resurrection so that we can understand this finality so although we haven't delved further into this conversation yet, I'll pick out some key points from the dialogue. So Jesus started off chapter 14 saying, believe in me as you also believe in God. Okay, he's going to prepare a place for them. Philip asks, well, show us the Father, show us, you know, God the Father, by which Jesus reaffirms to believe uh, in him um, because he is in the Father. Um, so Jesus is asking this in response to Jesus saying, you have seen the Father. Okay. And so um, in verse 28 through to 29 is very crucial because jesus sort of explains why he is saying this now when he could have said it after he it comes to pass the goal of telling the disciples so so it says here in, in 20, verse 28 to 29 later in the chapter you have heard how i say unto you i go away and come again unto you if you loved me you would rejoice because i said I go unto the Father, for the Father is greater than I, and now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So the, the goal here of telling the disciples before it comes to pass, rather than waiting till after it comes to pass, is that they might might believe. Now, this uh, uh, the, there's a question here then, isn't there? Haven't the disciples already expressed that they believe him do they not yet believe well we we explored this in the previous episode when we looked at john 13 peter already declared on behalf of all the disciples that they believe and are sure that jesus is the christ sounding very certain in john 6 and matthew 16 peter and the disciples said that they would be willing to follow jesus to the death but jesus knew that they would not go through this so yes they believe but arguably don't have a fully confident belief if if they don't have the boldness to go to death of the christ when they said they did that they're probably not going to have the boldness to preach mightily as as we would actually see them doing later in the book of acts so jesus needs to solidify their belief so that they will be able to go and do this so it might seem a bit hard to understand for you when i it might seem a bit cryptic but they, that's the goal he's telling them before it happens so that they believe when it happens essentially okay it's, it's sort of completing their belief it's solidifying their belief because at the moment they have an incomplete picture christ hasn't yet gone to his death burial and resurrection and uh, the disciples have struggled to grasp this idea that jesus must go to his death so um there's also when you, when you go to verse 12 uh, jesus goes on to say explain in this chapter that he who believes shall do greater works but as per the previous slide, the disciples need boldness to do those works. Okay. Um, in chapter 15, verse 16, he says, oh, I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Well, the, the fruit here is, 
not strictly defined in the verse per se, but if we assume it refers to their ministry in Acts, then we would further understand why Jesus needs to solidify their confidence so that they can bring forth this fruit. And then uh, just some crucial points uh, referring to verse 26 to 29 in chapter 14. We, we haven't got to it yet, obviously, but uh, Jesus is going to offer the Holy Ghost uh, to come onto them. But we, we know that this doesn't happen until after he breathes upon them. And, and that happens after the resurrection. Um, and Jesus is going to the Father and leaving them with peace. And as explained in the previous slide, Jesus is telling them these things before he will resurrect and see them again rather than waiting until then to tell them so that they will, will have full assurance. Okay, and so we can then consider how Jesus interacted with his disciples after his resurrection. So um, remember that Jesus has already explained to his disciples before John 14 that he must be killed and raised again. So he's already explained that he must be raised again on the third day he, and, and he's grouped them both together. When... Uh, when he does, when it does happen, um, when he does resurrect, Mary Magdalene, Johanna, and Jesus, Jesus' mother Mary, they, they tried to explain to the disciples what happened, but they didn't believe the account of the women at first. Now Jesus already told them that he would rise again on the third day. The women have witnessed it. The disciples aren't believing it yet. Okay, that's in in Luke's account. In Mark's account, um, after having already told the disciples in John 14 to 16 before his death to believe in him as they do the father and having already explained in Matthew 16 that he must go through these things Jesus upbraids their unbelief after he has risen again so uh, Luke 24 and John 20 give a bit more insight into this but um, in Luke 24 uh, Jesus has to open their understanding so it says then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures so this suggests that their understanding was closed from that perspective if we then look at how peter preached in acts 2 after jesus ascension it helps us to understand some context of john 14 to 16. so uh, in acts chapter 2 peter begins to preach against people who saw Jesus' miracles but still had him slain. Um, and then uh, later in that chapter, as explained earlier, this video is not set out to prove whether Jesus was in heaven or hell for three days and nights, but at least in this chapter, his, his death is associated with, with hell, not heaven. Um, whereas when Jesus unequivocally and you know inescapably ascends up to heaven, this is when he is at the right hand of the Father. So we can then logically conclude that when Jesus goes to the father in the john 14 context that this is in reference to his ascension rather than the three days and, and nights okay um, and as a side note in luke 23 the jesus told the thief on the cross that today he would be with jesus in paradise which if the above is true this does not really consider the three days gap between his death and resurrection but this also lends itself to the bible kind of com combining the death and resurrection as one thing in the scope of eternity ra rather than two separate events that we typically split in the the temporal world okay so I understand that I've gone on some really long tangents there and it seems like I'm bombarding you with irrelevant information. But the, the, the point I'm trying to explain to you is that if we take kind of a double meaning to this passage, yes, there is an immediate application to the disciples here that as per John 14, 28, Jesus will go away and come again, at least to the disciples, by resurrecting. Okay, but remember that this conversation is also preserved in the Bible for us today, so that wouldn't really mean very much to us if it really only applied to the disciples. However, he will also go away by leaving the disciples behind to go on and do the Great Commission, and will come again at the Second Coming, which the disciples must also preach. And they question Jesus about this, that in Acts chapter 1, to which Jesus cannot reveal any information concerning that time so they, they they did seem to understand that jesus must come again in a second coming context okay so uh, a lot of this what we have delved so far is not so much about how to be saved but it's, it's just very understand important in understanding the scope of john 14 to 16 as we explore the topic of salvation okay and, and so the key point here is that throughout john 14 to 16 jesus is talking about a lot of different things pertaining to the disciples from the point of view 
after he has ascended. So, so this is not merely about helping them to, you know, get through the next three days and just hang in there until it's all over in three days time. He needs to give them comfort for when they will be without Christ's physical presence after the ascension. And we need to borrow lessons from this. Okay. We need, we need to understand this if we're going to grasp an understanding of abiding in him and why Jesus is trying to solidify their confidence in their faith in this conversation so that they will not be discouraged. Jesus is telling his disciples what must come to pass before it comes to pass rather than waiting until afterwards because th there will be much more impact to his teaching for the purpose of why he is telling them all this okay now you might wonder then how does this apply to us today well well christians today don't really tend to stumble at the idea of jesus dying and being raised you know from the dead that seems you know most christians don't really struggle with that teaching the disciples were seemingly discouraged by his death and, and did not fully believe that he had risen again at first you know they didn't believe the women's testimony and then in particular you know we have the story of uh who we know is doubting thomas so we we don't tend to struggle with this because we have the hindsight to know that it has already happened we already know that jesus rose again so our confidence in this aspect is, is not lacking jesus doesn't need to solidify our confidence in something that we already know for sure happened but today though there are many christian there are many things that christians still have doubts about and one of the key doubts that many christians have is am i going to heaven okay and even christians who believe in faith alone and eternal security of the believers still struggle to have full confidence in their faith to, to make it to heaven um and so uh, you know, you know and, and it's not like Jesus is here for us to personally ask him as the disciples could have done okay so um well why do Christians today struggle to know whether they're truly saved well reason number one just like the disciples couldn't see afar off in this chapter failing to understand that Jesus must go to his death and be raised again you know we we cannot see our afterlife in heaven or hell i'm sure many of you wish that you could just have the foresight to know who is in heaven who is in hell or to be able to ask questions to those who made it to heaven just so that you would you know know for sure what to do to get in for those in hell it's obviously it's already too late they cannot change what they believe at this point yet they're so blinded this side of eternity and this is why it can be very traumatic and terrifying for, for many christians but we're not sure what we're supposed to do to get in you know we have all these verses about believing on him but then you know we do have these other verses about this that and such one of them being here in john chapter 14 if you love me keep my commandments and just as the disciples struggled with their belief in what jesus would go and do you know we likewise struggle with our belief in what he has done to get us where we want to be eternally uh, reason number two is that following the first reason you know there are just so many things going against us that we have to wave through it wave through an absolute tide of contrary information that looking for the truth sometimes feels like a needle in a haystack you know the work salvationists are throwing all their doctrines left right and center um you know and even among them don't we don't know which way is up you know the calvinists are telling us one thing the arminianists are telling us another thing catholics are telling us something else and even among the above you know they can subdivide these groups into many other different things is repentance a work is it not a work how do we know we're doing enough works or walking enough obedience when does our sin become a quote-unquote sinful lifestyle uh you know they all have their storehouses of verses that they quote to justify their various positions uh, the atheists are out there saying that science doesn't back up the bible and that the resurrection of christ didn't really happen and we have all this proof so-called that many things in the bible didn't happen or can't happen uh, the muslims are saying that if we believe there is a son of god we'll go to hell because god is above having a son and, and so on and so on and so on so you know it's just there's so much stuff being thrown against christians all the time that you know we someone just wants to know what is truth okay so you might ask then well why doesn't jesus just come down from heaven right now and personally tell me what i have to do to make it to heaven well the thing is he already personally came down from heaven and told his closest disciples that he must go to his death and three days later rise again they still didn't get it okay and they're not grasping some of this stuff in john chapter 14 either he also personally came down from heaven and said whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life and many christians today somehow managed to make that complicated um, a lot of people on YouTube, you can see these videos about sharing their testimonies of visions of hell or visions of heaven and visions of good and visions of evil, visions of Jesus and these various near-death experiences, but they don't all agree doctrinally on the path to uh, 
heaven or even who God is. And actually, if you look at the testimonies of some of those people, some of them, it's really pointed them more towards deism rather than Christianity. The, the idea that there's something and some kind of good and evil and some kind of choice, but not really Christian Christianity specifically. Uh, and many of their visions, actually, when they are Christian visions, don't even correspond with the Bible. Uh, a lot of them have these visions that Satan is ruling and reigning in hell, but this is fiction. It, it comes from Dante's Inferno. It doesn't come from the Bible. So, so this question of, you know, why doesn't Jesus just come down and personally tell me? Well, a more substantial answer is that eternal life is a hope, okay? It's something that we do not yet see, but, but we hope for it, okay? We, we don't today hope that Jesus will rise from the dead. That already happened. The disciples hoped for it arguably but it's already happened for us we do need to hope though that christ will help us make it into heaven right now uh, hebrews does talk about this in some detail i'm not going to read them out but you can see them on the screen they're like hebrews 10 uh, the writer explains that we have a hope in heaven uh, and although this has cost the recipients in earthly goods uh, our goods are in heaven are much better in an enduring substance because we have this better hope he exhorts us to have patience and to keep our confidence quote unquote so as to receive this promise after having done the will of God, uh, which in, in this context, we can interpret that as, as kept the faith, um, given, you know, given the upcoming verses. And so then when we're called to live by faith, trusting in what Jesus accomplished to obtain the eternal promise and, and not be those who draw back, you know, those who kind of believe for a while and, and fall away. But because we have this hope and we have this promise, we endure in our belief to the saving of the soul, holding on to our confidence. And then Hebrews will go on to explain what faith is. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. We we have seen Jesus' resurrection in hindsight. We we know it happened from the Bible, but we have not seen the manifestation of our eternal life yet. So likewise, the disciples in John 14 through 16 have not yet seen the resurrection and they're, they are doubtful, as Jesus' dialogue to them indicates. Okay, so I, I know we've digressed quite a lot from John 14, but I hope that will kind of help give you a more substantial overview of what needs to happen here. So you could argue, yes, there is an immediate context to John 14, 2 and 3, that Jesus will come again to the disciples specifically. They are witnesses of, re, re, uh, you know, the resurrection. But there is a wider application to all believers. When when So when Jesus goes to prepare a place for them this is accomplished in what he is about to go and do he will go to the cross he will rise again so that believers can access heaven to begin with and then he returns to the father where he will prepare the heavenly rewards and, and the thrones for the disciples and so on and so forth now uh, between verses four and six in john 14 jesus explains that the disciples know the way and then so you might ask, well, the way to where? After all, that that is how Thomas replied, Lord, we don't know where you go. How do we know the way? Jesus explained in the previous verses, and we'll explain later, he goes to the Father. That's where he's going. Okay. They, you know, they ought to know this. So Thomas ought to know the way to the Father, because this is something that Jesus explained in John's Gospel previously when he was explaining to the Jews how to have eternal life. But so while these statements would not have been directed at Thomas, he he would have presumably been there to hear hear them in most cases. So to an extent, coming from Thomas, this is a rather silly question. But as as we've been exploring, you know, the disciples aren't fully understanding what Jesus is trying to tell them. Okay. But, um, I've I've really you know bumped. I mean, some of these argue from unsaved people rather than saved people. But I have bumped into similar problems when trying to put material together for this series and various other things that I've done, like the, the documentary, uh, when discussing these matters with various people. So, for example, you know, I try to explain to people the concepts of faith alone and eternal security, and they get some kind of question like, well, what, a, but what about if somebody uses this as a license to sin? Well, that's got nothing to do with whether these doctrines are true or not, really. It's completely irrelevant. It's an irrelevant question. And the chastisement of believers deals with that issue, or, you know, of someone who sins. Um, or I try to explain to, you know, the Bible does not say, repent of your sins to be saved. And then what do they do? Well, they either point to a verse that doesn't say this phrase, or they point to a verse that says, repent, but does not say, of your sins. Or they point to a verse that's not even about salvation. And then uh, there's been another example where somebody once used a passage to try and make an assertion that Revelation 20 shows that Christians will be judged according to their works. But 
I disprove that by demonstrating that it specifically says the dead are judged according to their works, not not those in the book of life. And then the person who confronted him with that, all I got from him is just what about me on some other passage somewhere else. Instead of going back to Revelation 20 and telling me why I was wrong about Revelation 20, but then would also refuse to repent of lying about Revelation 20. And so the, the I mean, these are more extreme examples because, you know, these un, unregenerate people, but the, this is just examples of people not grasping basic teaching okay and the disciple you know they're, they're struggling on basic teaching at least the disciples are struggling on something a bit more advanced and then between uh, verses 7 through to 9 um, you might ask the question why why does jesus say this phrase um, if you had known me D didn't the disciples know jesus better than anyone okay well if you sort of read what he's saying here that the point isn't so much that they haven't known him up to this point rather jesus point is that supposing that they have known him and obviously they they have they should have known the father also okay but based on their questioning and the kind of question that philip asks it would seem that the disciples are not grasping that jesus is of the father they know he is the christ but perhaps they don't know what this means. And so following Philip's question, you can easily visualise Jesus' frustration that he's trying to explain something seemingly so basic and his disciples are not grasping it. Um, by, by seeing in the, Jesus in the flesh, they have seen God. It's that simple. They, you know, they're, they're somehow making it sound like it's profound or complicated. It's really not that profound. They've seen Jesus in the flesh. They've seen God. It, it's that simple. Um, and we, so if we want to visualize what God is like, well, we can do that according to Jesus' behavior and his statements. Okay. So uh, carrying on our reading in John 14, then verses 10 through to 16. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Uh, truly truly i say unto you he that believes on me the works that i shall do he shall do also and greater works than these he shall do because i go unto my father and whatsoever you ask in my name that shall i do uh, will i do sorry and that the father may be glorified in the son if you shall ask anything in my name i will do it if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever so following Philip's doubtful question then, Jesus re-emphasizes to his disciples what he what what he has expressed to unsaved Jews in pre previously in John's Gospel, particularly in chapter ten. He he told Jews to believe in the works that he does. He told Jews that he is one with the Father and that the Father dwelling in him does the works. Okay, there are your verse references there. So it seems as if Jesus is having to go back to the basics with his disciples here. He's already explained all of this in front of them before, and yet here he finds himself explaining it again. But since he keeps telling them to believe in this chapter, he needs to reaffirm important truths with them so that they will stay confident in this belief. Okay? Now let's let's liken this today to us as believers. What you know, because we have seasons of um, and periods of doubt in our lives, right? And sometimes Sometimes those doubts may be about salvation, but oftentimes doubts may be about even other of the most basic things Jesus said, such as um, a classic example would be Jesus's discourse about worrying. OK, so you, obviously you've got the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, but you've also got this in Matthew 12. I'm not going to read it all out, but, you, you know, you're probably very familiar with this passage. OK, the chances are. And so, you know, Jesus gives his discourse about not worrying about these things. OK, and just as the disciples in John 14 appear to be somewhat doubtful, Jesus predicts our lack of faith in the conversation where he talks about worrying. So, you know, what what does he have to say about people who worry in Luke 12? Well, it's you have little faith. You have a doubtful mind. That That's the problem. OK, so he associates worrying about life's basic necessities with having little faith or having a doubtful mind. Now, his teaching in Luke 12 is very simple. It's not profoundly complicated or difficult to be understood. Jesus uses analogies, but he doesn't really speak in parables. It, it's such basic teaching in a way, okay? So the, there, now there are some things where the Bible takes a more balanced view on certain issues. Like, you know, there's a bit, a bit, bit of that one way and a bit of that the other way. But this issue really of not worrying, it's very one-sided, okay? It's not, well, don't worry, but then, you know, worry about it. it there's very one-sided dialogue here. 
And that, you know, that we're told quite dogmatically, do not worry about these things. And yet many of us repeatedly do. If, if somebody came up to you and said, Hey, maybe this Jesus you believe in isn't all he's meant to be, you know, maybe consider Krishna or the teachings of Muhammad, you would immediately and confidently say, no, get out. You know, that, that wouldn't even be put into question. We, we don't second guess as Christians that Jesus is the son of God or that he died and rose again. Yet a teaching so simple as, you know, do not worry about your your needs it, it sounds lovely when we read it in church but then we, we second guess what jesus said when it actually comes to application why well it's it's the little faith of a, a doubtful mind and um so likewise then we, we can somewhat understand why the disciples are stumbling on some of the basic teachings that jesus has given in front of them several times before okay that you know he's in the father the father is in him believing for the works and so we see then that the believe me in this context it is not actually about giving the gospel to, to tell unsaved people how to be saved, but rather it's to exhort his closest disciples and by extension of that Christians today, if you like, and increase their confidence in their faith in him. And what he is about to go and do after this conversation will solidify their faith when they realize that Jesus can defeat even death itself, you know, when they actually see him resurrected, when they already saw him crucified. Okay. So uh, returning to John 14, then we see through verses 11 while 14, that further building on this, Christ is exhorting them to believe him because he has proven himself by his works. He then encourages the disciples likewise that he has done many works before them. Those that believe will go on to do greater works than these because Jesus is returning to the Father. So it's going to be up to the disciples from that, you know, from now on. The Father will, excuse me, support them in this work and they can ask things in Jesus' name and whatsoever things they want or need for the glorification of the Father, it, it shall be uh, done unto them. Okay. Um, and a lot of Christians may struggle with these verses. Uh, particularly in verse 12, because it sounds like if, if we truly have faith in Christ, you know, we, we should be doing miracles abundantly or, or works abundantly left, right and centre because Jesus did these things abundantly without hindrance. And obviously it said that we had gone to do greater works than, than he did. And, and they were examples of the works that he did, right? So, you know, a lot of people would struggle with that. Well, uh, we won't di spend too much time on this because it, it will digress off topic, but we, we can summarize some points and then consider a few things to understand this in scope. If we compare John's gospel to Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus did indeed do many miracles and John, but John's gospel overall, you know, with the odd exceptions, overall it has less emphasis on his miracles than other gospels do. John's account has much more emphasis on the preaching of eternal life, which, bearing in mind, is the purpose for which is written. And so it's arguably, you know, more important than the other Gospels in setting the premise for works here in John 14. When John wrote this account, he was not necessarily considering other Gospel accounts in mind, which may or may not have even been written or distributed widely yet. So he needs to write a Gospel account that's self-sufficient. So within his self-sufficient Gospel, he's emphasised Christ preaching eternal life to various people far more than miracles. Now, miracles are featured, yes, but they're not featured in John's Gospel anywhere near as much as they were in the other Gospel accounts, okay? Now, miracles themselves don't amount to salvation because Jesus upbraided many cities for not believing in him, despite miracles being seen there. So even if we could do miracles left, right and centre, that, that doesn't mean that the whole world around us is going to get saved. And that, that's a trap that Pentecostals and people in the charismatic movement and, and the new apostolic reformation tend to fall in. That, you know, if, if we can be demonstrated to be doing these mighty things, you know, the world will just kneel before Jesus and, you know, dominionism and all that kind of stuff. But really, there, there were plenty of people who saw Jesus' miracles and didn't believe on him. OK. And even if the whole world were more Christian and, and less atheist or less Muslim, that, that still doesn't automatically equate to people getting saved. You know, lots of people believe in a sort of Jesus, what the Bible calls another Jesus. And lots of people believe he could do miracles, but that, that does not mean that they were all saved. So, you know, ultimately many of them still trust in their works to save them to, to some extent. So, you know, don't, don't get too wrapped up in, in miracles in that regard. And so, you know, should believers be upon miracles? Well, you know, the, the Pentecostal and the charismatic movements often emphasise miracles as being intrinsically part of the, the Christian package. 
with, with some even believing or many believing that these miracles must accompany salvation or the salvation is not valid but you know they, they have to stretch that to tongue speaking i guess because at least that's something you can kind of fake but um you know most if not all people who talk constantly about miracles such as these health and wealth teachers and word of faith movements they're all frauds so you know that really ought to tell you a lot about that um, and many 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 standalone preachers on social media who are not part of these groups and would even acknowledge that these groups are fraudulent that there are people on youtube who claim to have seen many miracles and they're trying to use that to justify their gospel message um you know but the thing is that again these are never publicly verifiable so i've seen miracles in my life so you know i know that conditional security is true or i know that this doctrine is true but remember that jesus did his works publicly and it was the public who told the rest of the public what they saw that's why jesus did not directly write the gospels about himself now just in case anybody's wondering i do not believe in cessationism but but here are some important points regarding believers doing miracles and works in jesus's name that the primary goal of jesus doing his works is that people would believe that he is the christ and his, his works pointed to himself we however point others to him as christ we, you know we don't point others to ourselves as the christ remember also that in order to cast out devils and work miracles the disciples had to be given specific authority uh, in the book of acts we see the disciples giving the holy spirit but we do not specifically see them passing on the authority to do miracles per se. Um, it seems that authority was generally concentrated on people who actually saw Christ while on earth, with the exception of Paul, who saw Christ in a vision, vision after Christ had ascended to the Father. But, but this was acknowledged by the other disciples. And then this is quite important. The performing of miracles is, is not really widely emphasised as a subject matter in the epistles so you know we have a lot of miracles in the gospels we have a lot of miracles in acts but then it's not it's not a big topic really when you look at the epistles when the epistles talk about the works quote unquote that believers should do they're generally more about easily everyday conceivable things that aren't really in any way miraculous or supernatural like you know abstain from a sin or love one another in such a way or conduct church in, in such a manner okay you know a lot of the works in the, in the epistles aren't really about miracles that's not really what the disciples emphasized as the works that believers should be doing and so ex excluding miracles then what what about works generally doing work generally is jesus insisting that a true saved believer will have works to accompany their faith well the thing is you have to ask the question what kind of works is jesus talking about here what works could possibly what works could we possibly do so i think i've done a, a spelling mistake there that, that, that could in any way be greater than the works that that jesus did okay that, that's a good question well consider the various works that jesus did and how a believer could possibly do greater works than jesus how, how is this in any way possible well doing miracles you'll be very hard pressed to find anybody in this world who's doing anywhere near as many miracles as jesus did and if you see somebody who claims that they do so they're probably a f fraud you know doing the old leg lengthening trick or something like that if it's about obedience and living righteously well he was the only one who was tempted at all points as we are yet without sin he said there is no none good but god to the rich man and of course we know that jesus is good so again trying to do more works in that regard than jesus is is very problematic uh, suffering unjustly for walking upright well the bible said even if you do suffer unjustly for walking upright the bible says he was marred more than any other man uh, no other suffering described by the saints in the bible comes anywhere near close to how jesus suffered so you know none amounted to jesus level of righteousness and so really then what else is left and i can personally only really think of one thing and that's the preaching of the kingdom or, or the gospel of eternal life to the masses because jesus mostly preached to jewish audiences with with some exceptions and many of the jews that listened to him rejected him anyway um as far as we know uh jesus didn't venture very far from judea sorry another spelling mistake there um, in any of his frequent travels it, it is likely that the furthest he ever traveled from judea was probably when his parents fled to egypt long before jesus even started any of his ministry or did the works that are documented in the gospel accounts and he maybe reached a few thousand people in, at first in his lifetime he, he's almost absent from secular historical sources most of our reliable information about jesus comes from the bible however the the apostles reached the masses in acts and traveled far and wide spreading the gospel abroad to the gentiles as well as the jews 
Uh, many of their converts went to spread the gospel in their native homelands. The gospel was issued to many different languages and peoples in Acts chapter 2. And Jesus sent his disciples out to preach the kingdom at the doorsteps. We, we don't know for, for certain that he went with them to do this, because if he has 12 disciples and he sends them out two by two, that would leave Jesus without a companion. Okay. And while Jesus dealt with many hard-hearted Jews, in Acts chapter 3, Jesus admonishes a Jewish audience for rejecting and killing Christ, and about 5,000 people were converted just following that one conversation. Okay. And so, you know, if you think about it, there's an endless supply of doors for door-to-door -door evangelism. The internet provides an easy way to distribute the gospel to almost anywhere in the world. And so as a result of the legacy left by the apostles, the name of Jesus has spread far and wide to most of the civilized world. Jesus became far more famous after his death, resurrection and ascension than during his lifetime. Okay. But given what I have said, though, I have to then answer this question. What if I don't have all of, you know, these? You need to be careful about not using this passage to assist, insist that believers will do more works than Jesus. Because that, that's really a very high bar to me. Okay? That's a very high standard anyway. Because really Jesus' works are hard to quantify. We, we don't even know everything that Jesus even did. Okay, so, you know, I'm very suspicious of people who want to take that verse to insist that believers will have works because that's, that's really an understatement of what it says. It says, he that believes on me will do greater works. Okay. Romans 4, 5 is very clear that to him that does not work, but believes on him, which justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, it's not, well, it could be, it, it is. We have examples of people in the Bible who were believers, but their works could not really be demonstrated, such as the, the thief on the cross or Lazarus in Luke 16. And Jesus said this is an encouragement. Jesus said this in John 14 as an encouragement to the disciples. It's not a doctrinal statement. If, it, if it's so important that believers should do greater works than Jesus, and, and that is a very high bar, well, then the disciples or the apostles should have re-emphasized this in their epistles, but they didn't. Okay, so, you know, Jesus is saying it as an encouragement, not as like a demand that you must do this in order to be saved. Okay. You know, contextually, we can demonstrate that that's consistent with what he's, he's talking about here. And it's consistent with what follows later in the Bible. So now we have arrived at what is probably one of the most important verses in, in John 14 for our study. If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, this verse is very widely quoted or misquoted and misapplied to teach a hard line works based salvation. So we need to spend a lot of time exploring this issue so that we're not thrown off by this and understand it in the wider context of the Bible. So what we're going to explore is um, what are his commandments that we are supposed to keep in, in this verse? Is it anything to do with eternal life? And what are the implications of not loving God if we want to make it to heaven? Okay. So first and foremost, I think it helps to read until the end of the chapter as this will help the context by understanding the wider conversation taking place. So starting from uh, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray, Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which has sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, to whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I.' 
And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, even so do I. Arise, let us go hence. So there are a few things going on here. Um, firstly, we, we do see a clear association between loving God and keeping the commandments, which appears to be a mutual, albeit conditional love. Now, normally this is the part of the study where I would point out to you, you know, it does not say, if thou shalt have eternal life, keep my commandments. And instead, you know, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's more difficult to get away with it on this particular passage, though, because a lot of Christians, wherever they are on the faith or work spectrum, would have some difficulty accepting a separation between eternal life and loving Jesus. So the idea of having eternal life while well, not loving Jesus kind of sounds strange to us and counterintuitive to the Bible, which is perhaps why some people struggle with this passage and, and would be unco uncomfortable decoupling it from eternal life. And secondly, while we're not studying the Holy Spirit in this video, <clears throat> we do see that the giving of the Holy Spirit as a comforter is interchangeable with the keeping of the commandments here being blended into the same passage. And so what we can take from the interchangeable mention of the Holy Spirit with keeping the commandments is that this is really very encouraging language. Christ is going to comfort his disciples. He's not really warning his disciples, if thou shalt not do this, then hellfire and damnation will happen. Instead, he's exhorting them, saying, keep my commandments and I will manifest myself unto you and I will send you the comforter. So he's telling this for their comfort, not for their discomfort okay so you see here very quickly how people misappropriate this verse using it as some kind of a dire warning to discourage you by gaslighting your salvation when actually jesus is using it as an encouragement you know the, the guy who screams or the guy who believes in work salvation you know if jesus said if you love me keep my commandments if you're not on your knees every day seeking the lord and obeying his commandments and changing your ways you know you will lose your salvation and perish for eternity so this this guy is using john 14 to like tear you down and, and discomfort you when actually Look at the language that Jesus actually uses. The comforter shall come to you. The comforter shall teach you. Jesus is trying to edify your faith and actually give you comfort here. That's what's actually going on in this chapter. Okay. So there are a few things that we need to explore from this verse. And this is really going to dominate our study of John fourteen fifteen. What exactly does it mean to love Jesus in this context? And, and is this a necessary requirement for salvation? Um, is it imperative, i.e. it's an instruction, so do you love me, yes, keep my commandments, or is it indicative, uh, you know, an evidence of, in other words, if you love me, this will be shown by the fact that you keep my commandments, so we need to look at that. And then, finally, what are the commandments that must be kept in this context? What what kind of commandments is Jesus even talking about here? Because often, you know, people read words like commandment and obey, and they automatically think, turn from all of your sins, when there are other types of commandments that aren't necessarily to do with sin itself, or sins of the flesh at least. Okay, so first, let's look at whether it's an instruction or an indication of, uh, of evidence. There is potential for confusion here because of, uh, you know, how translations of this verse vary. So, you know, I, I normally use the King James, not not really apologetic about that. Um, but the King James makes it look imperative, i.e. do you love me? If yes, then I instruct you to keep my commandments. Whereas if you look at something like the ESV, uh, this, the English Standard Version makes it look more indicative, i.e. if you truly love me, this will be proven by the evidence that you will keep my commandments. Now, uh, perhaps the issue is from translation because Greek has a wider variety of verb forms to express indicative and imperative and pre present future tense, whereas English would instead require a, a wider vocabulary of words to express the tense or the mood of the verb. So how exactly you translate this is, is perhaps somewhat problematic. I don't, you know, I don't read Greek, but, um, you know, you can sort of find this information out. So um, as I've explained before in this channel, I don't speak Greek, but we don't really need to no Greek to, to figure this out because in a way our English Bible even in the King James Bible here already really answers this question because later on in the same chapter Jesus says he so that's 
whosoever he happens to be that has my commandments and keeps them he it is that that loves me so uh, and then he goes on to say you know if a man loves me he will keep my words even in the king james and so it seems to be very evident from the text that this is indicative that the keeping of jesus commandments here whatever those commandments happen to be is evident of having love for him so in verse 15 jesus addresses you the disciples but then he'll elevate it to he or if a man you know whosoever he happens to be so this passage seems to imply that keeping jesus commandments is a fundamental part of loving him or loving god and this also seems to be uh, how the disciple john understood it from this conversation because he then echoes these themes uh, in his epistles particularly in 1 john 3 and 5 and, and 2 john as well now don't don't panic before anybody starts panicking this is not teaching works-based salvation we will understand this as we continue our study by understanding what jesus is actually saying here in its full context with a wider understanding of the bible we will see that this does not contradict faith without works in any way actually if anything it establishes faith without works and we will explore this in our study and hopefully leave no stone unturned so given that the surrounding language and john's similar writings in his epistles suggest that keeping jesus commandments in this context is indicative of those who love him this leads us on to the next question uh, do we need to love jesus or love god to have eternal life is it possible to get into heaven without loving god well the question obviously especially the latter half almost sounds strange regardless of whether you believe in faith alone or faith plus works it's hard to us for imagine that somebody could hate god quote unquote or, or not love god at least and somehow still go to heaven this obviously seems like a strange and counterintuitive idea well perhaps all this confusion here lies from uh the distinction or rather our inability to distinguish between love as an emotion a state of mind and love as an action you know actually doing something for love and so uh with this mind we should be careful not to confuse not loving god sufficiently with, with hating god though those shouldn't exactly be confused as being the same thing you know they're not directly equatable um failing to put our love for god into action is not the same as a willful intense contempt for god that say you know an extreme atheist might express or some someone like that and furthermore we, we must also understand the difference between what we must do and, and things that we ought to do okay so um first and foremost we must understand how the love of god actually works in relation to salvation and we, we would understand very quickly that the transaction that happens is really god loving us it's not us loving god really so these are just some examples on the screen so you know famous one john three sixteen. for god so loved the world it's not that the world loved god that you know whoever believes in him should have eternal life and so on you've got like romans 5 8 god commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners christ died for us um second thessalonians 2 16 our lord jesus christ himself and god even our father which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace and then revelation 1 5 unto him that loved us and washed out washed us from our sins in his own blood so notice how salvation or things that apply to it such as the blood of jesus is according to god loving us it's not according to the other way around okay and moreover aside from john three sixteen, we can find an, abund an abundance of verses uh, plenty of scriptures to the effect of believe on him have eternal life okay we, we don't have an abundance of scriptures to the effect of love god have eternal life and, and additionally notice how the love is described as happening in the past god did the work in the past because salvation was a one-time event when we first believed not not an ongoing journey as the work salvation crowd like to um suppose now there's obviously the issue of the, the greatest commandment in the in the bible love the lord your god we'll probably talk about that a little bit later in in the study okay so um i think one john four might help us to understand this in more scope given that john repeats a lot of the same themes from the conversation with jesus in, in john 14 you know abide uh, love one another commandments all that kind of thing this helps us to understand how john himself interpreted what 
Jesus said in that conversation. So in in 1 John 4, in verse 8, John associates loving God with knowing God, or rather, you know, if you don't love, you you don't know God. So, So these two things appear to be interchangeable. And then he then goes on to say, in verses 9, 10, and 19, uh, these are very important contextually. Just like we saw with the verses on the, the previous slide, John says it's it's not that we loved God. Instead, he loved us. And so, you know, to send his propitiation for our sins. So in other words, we, we don't have the propitiation for our sins on the account of we loved God. Rather, it's on the account that God loved us. Okay, uh, you know, perfectly consistent. And further reinforces the verses on the previous slide, and it, it's no accident that John is telling us this. Okay, and then uh, in this same passage in verses eleven and twelve, John then gives us a cause for loving one another. Uh, you know, he doesn't say love one another that thou shalt be saved, but rather God loved us, and that's in the past tense. Okay, uh, we also, so we who are born of God, ought to love one another present tense so it's not that and no man has seen god at any time but if we love one another god dwells in us and his love is perfected in us and so he gives us a reason here for loving one another just as god loved us and that makes us born of god um, we therefore ought to love the other people who have been born of this same god because they're our brothers and sisters in christ okay and then when you get to the end of the chapter and on to John 5, John repeats the love commandments theme from John 14, with loving the brethren as being a very key theme, a very key commandment there. Okay, and if you're familiar with John's epistle, you'll notice that he he, keep, he talks about keeping his commandments frequently, but he does not really talk about the sins of the flesh as other writers would. Uh, you know, for instance, Paul in Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5. Rather, John tends to deal with doctrinal issues primarily. So, now don't get me wrong, John does talk about sin, particularly in the third chapter of his ep- epistle, and a little bit at the end of the first, uh, uh, you know, first chapter and second chapter. Sorry, I had a brain uh, went for a moment there. But if we take the letter as a whole to provide context as to what kinds of sin he's talking about you know he doesn't talk about drunkenness or fornication or adultery or murder or theft or covetousness or bitterness or you know the typical fleshly sins and wantings things that are behavioral not doctrinal john's epistle doesn't really talk about those things except for one fairly under uh, understated ending verse about idolatry you know the very last verse in the epistle um, instead, really, in, in the totality of his epistle, he talks about loving those who were born of God that we, uh, you know, that, that we love and who first love, uh, loved us. And he talks about believing the record and the witness of his son and the father and acknowledging the account of the son, you know, confessing him and abiding in him. Uh, being aware of antichrists who in, deny important truth about Jesus and the record of him that is essential to, to being born of God as per the, the second point and etc etc so as far as salvation is concerned you know going by John's epistles to to explain to us how John interpreted John 14 it, it really his the commandments in his epistles have far more to do with faith in the record of the son and, and loving other people who believe that same record, rather than the thou shalt do's and the thou shalt do nots. And so then following this, because we now have salvation as a result of God's love for us, therefore also loving the brethren because they're born of the same God that loves us. That appears to be the, the kind of commandments that, that John's actually talking about in his um, epistle. Okay. And so this will be very important in helping us to understand the, the commandments that John 14 is talking about. And now that we understand how John um, in, himself interpreted this conversation with Jesus. So we, we will delve into this further, but we'll just park it for now, because that there's more to be addressed while we're still on the subject of loving God. And, and so the next point to explain then is where the commandment to love God comes from. Because, so, you know, Jesus says it almost as if it's a new commandment, really. But it, it's not some radical, new, controversial, crazy or, you know, revolutionary idea in the New Testament. It was already there in the Old Testament law. But Jesus reestablishes it with a with New Testament principles. And, and, and it now applies to himself as the son of God, the Messiah, who was not fully known or manifest in the Old Testament. So, you know, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6... Uh, an Old Testament law was to love the Lord thy God, you know, with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Okay. But then you, you go to the next chapter and it, it, Deuteronomy that explains that loving God is not merely emotional or a state of mind, but it's tied with 
action and it's tied with keeping the commandments that he's given and that's a fundamental part of loving god which is a similar theme that jesus echoes in in john 14 that if you love me you know keep keep my commandments now you're probably very familiar with, with what jesus said about this so um i mentioned i would address this so uh scribes asked him which uh, is the first commandment of all, of all or you know what's the greatest commandment essentially and uh, this this you know jesus actually answered this on more than one occasion actually in the bible so um loving god then we see is the greatest of all commandments followed by loving your neighbor as yourself essentially these are the you know you're very familiar with this i'm sure um, and he also said this to the lawyer that was attempting to test him in matthew 22 and said all the law and the prophets hangs on these two commandments however those are commandments from the old testament law and we also know from the new testament very clearly that, that nobody can be justified at least not for righteousness in any case by the works of the law as, as the new testament you know extensively explains so you only have to go to romans on you know every other page paul explained that to be justified by the law you have to do it you have to obey it you, you can't just hear it you've got to obey the law he then goes on to explain in the next chapter nobody does obey the law all have sinned all come for uh, you know all the fall foul of the the, the law so we, we cannot be justified by it for that very reason he then goes on to explain that justification for righteousness in context is without the law because we're incapable of meeting the requirement and even in james 2 you know people love to uh quote james 2 about being justified by works but the thing is james writes that justification is for the profit of the brethren not for righteousness and explains that we can't meet the requirements of the law for the very same reason that paul does you know if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point you are guilty of, of the whole law so really what james says there is consistent with what what paul himself says so i think all of that probably answers the question about loving god but but what about knowing god because you might ask well surely it's not possible to believe in god without really knowing him and although no verse in john 14 directly couples knowing god with keeping his commandments the, the concept of knowing god is sandwiched between the verses about loving god and the keeping of the commandments so the, even in john 14 they appear to be interchangeable even if no single verse couples those two things together and so uh, when john picks up on the same theme as his epistles he, he makes it quite clear that keeping his commandments whatever this means is equated with knowing him so that you know those two things can't really be isolated and knowing god and loving god seem to be synonymous in uh, john's epistle but actually you know if you study other parts of the bible really just the same as loving god the concept even exploring the concept of knowing god salvation and eternal life has really more to do with god knowing you rather than knowing god so for example the you know the famously quoted passage about uh, you know matthew 7 not everyone that says unto me lord lord and then i will profess unto them and notice what it says i never knew you so what was the problem with the lord lord people you know was it that they didn't know jesus well enough because of their works well no the problem is that jesus didn't know them that that's what the problem was and then um john uh, 1 john 4 16 and we have known and believed the love that god has to us so you know knowing god is in this context at least is related to believing in the love that god has for us not in our love for god rather than commandments at least in this particular uh, context or at least that's defining the kind of commandments that he's talking about and then galatians is interesting here because paul describes the recipients as have you have known god in the past in contrast to previous verses where they served false gods but then in the same verse he then he then corrects his own terminology as if to say um you know you have known god or rather so in other words let me correct what i've just said or use more appropriate terminology um it is you know as if to say it's not wrong to say that you have known god when you believed god but it's more appropriate to say you are known of god this is more doctrinally appropriate and so you know and you can also consider paul's writings about predestination too and so yes in a manner of speaking when you believed on god yes you have known god since that point but but rather it's, it's more correct to say that god has known you at least in a salvation context okay
And one more minor point to say about this issue is, is that the concept of knowing God isn't really one fixed thing. It's a fairly fluid thing because it, it means different things in different places. So in, in some verses, those that don't believe or, the, you know, the perishing world as described as those who don't know God. Um, for example, 1 Corinthians one twenty one, 1 John 3, 1. Um, whereas in other verses, actually the wicked world is described as knowing God, at least to a sufficient extent of having accountability. For example, Romans uh, one twenty one. So because knowing God has a somewhat loose and fluid definition in various contexts in the Bible, we should be careful about building our salvation doctrine around a fluid concept, because knowing God in one sense is not the same as loving him in another sense you know you can know somebody's an acquaintance you can know somebody you know as your wife you can know somebody's your best friend there, there are different ways of knowing and even you know knowing people in the bible sometimes that refers to like when when adam knew eve for example so you know it is a bit of a fluid concept it doesn't automatically mean one thing every time we, we see it okay and so in conclusion then we, we cannot use john 14 to to justify loving god for our salvation or knowing god for our salvation it it, it falls apart for the really the very same reason that, that salvation by the law falls apart that your lo loving your knowing isn't sufficient that's why it's god that loved you and it's god that knew you but we we do need to study the meaning of commandments in this verse so that we will understand the purpose of why jesus is saying this and, it, and in regards to salvation really our study will only further establish that we still can't get to heaven by loving god and, and obeying his commandments okay because even jesus closest disciples did not meet this criteria and, and we will see this okay so our last point on john uh on, on verse 15 then is to understand what jesus means by my commandments because there are different things that this could mean you know does he mean my laws and statutes like moral laws does he mean my doctrines and foundations does he mean anything i have ever commanded in any of the four gospels or does he mean anything the bible has ever commanded in the old or the new testament and or anything that the new testament has ever commanded does he mean anything i have ever commanded to my 12 disciples specifically does he mean anything i have commanded to all believers or instead is he talking about the things i command in this conversation in john 13 to 16 specifically so you can understand there are different ways of interpreting this and we, we need to understand which is the most appropriate one okay so reading it on the surface jesus brings forward an, an old testament principle into a new testament one so in the old testament believers were commanded to love the lord your god and obey the commandments but the name of jesus the son of god was not yet known okay but we, we know that there is no salvation or no righteousness by the law um they were also commanded to love your neighbor as yourself nevertheless in the new testament believers are commanded to love jesus and keep his commandments um, a lot of jesus commandments are built on the old testament law which points to christ anyway so there's still no can't really be any salvation by works in the new testament either because a lot of those are really founded on old testament um laws and uh, jesus commands his disciples to love one another and this is important to understand because um a lot of uh, work salvation advocates will dance around Paul's teaching by stating that we're not, we're not justified by Old Testament law, but we need to be justified by New Testament law of love or, or something like that. You know, I've, I've, I mean, people word it in different ways, but I ha have seen that before. Um, but as we've already seen, look, love is not a concept that's new in the New Testament. Okay, it's part of the law, and we can't be justified by the law. So what Jesus is really doing here is taking an Old Testament principle and bringing it into a New Testament application. So hopefully this chart will help to visualize this. So we have our Old Testament principle, love God and obey his commandments. This then translates into the New, uh, New Testament application, love the Son of God and obey his commandments. We have the Old Testament principle of love your neighbor as defined by a blood relation or the nation of Israel or society that then is carried forward as love one another but now it's it's not defined by you as a neighbor or you as um, a citizen of the same country but rather it's defined by your love for Christ and, and Christ's love for you so there, there's the principles but but there's the application okay so think about the, the following if we asked somebody who believes in a works-based salvation of some kind or, or insists that works must be produced if the faith is genuine what we need to ask them what commandments we must obey in this context and we need to consider what kind of list would they come up with 
Okay, we then need to consider from the point of view of the disciples, what commandments was Jesus telling them to obey and, and how would they have interpreted this statement? And then, you know, if we look at various interpretations of this verse, what are their merits and shortcomings? Okay, so, you know, as we saw from a few slides ago, there, there are various different ways of um, interpreting Jesus' commandments. You know, what which one of these kind of things does he mean? So let's start with the interpretation of obeying anything and everything that Jesus said, you know, either that the New Testament says or that Jesus specifically says in the red letters. Because although not everybody says it this way, this is generally how a lot of people read it. And so, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments in, in this verse over here. Well, then over here in this verse, Jesus said not to commit adultery. And then over here in this verse, Jesus said, sin no more. And then over here in this verse, Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize. And then over here in this verse, the disciples commanded people to get baptized. And then over here in this verse, Jesus told Jezebel to repent of her fornication. And then following that, you know, Jesus commands these things, but then other, the disciples themselves command things like, you know, James says that faith must be justified by works. And so, you know, it's kind of like a conspiracy theory board with all these strings going across to all these different places. This is sort of how a lot of people interpret that. They, okay, well, it says keep my commandments. So they just pluck out any sort of random commandments they can find and, and join all of that together. Okay. So then many Christians, if, if you ask them, what, what commandments is Jesus referring to? If, if the, la the lazy answer is, they might say all of them, because then they don't have to pick an arbitrary list and they don't have to leave no stone unturned with any commandment. Because if, if they say, if they gave you a specific list, you might ask, well, how do you know that he meant those and not this other commandment? Do you know what I mean? So, um, but that being said, though, even though they might say all of them, they, they do have their cherry picked examples. So they like to cherry pick. Uh, you know, the, the deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me verse. They like to cherry pick the go and sin no more verse. Um, they like to cherry pick the pluck out your eye and cut off your hand verse. They like to cherry pick the, uh, the lukewarm verse as well. So then uh, it is true that because Jesus did command me these things, they will wrap all of that up in John fourteen fifteen. If you love me, keep my commandments. So they'll say, you know, well, see, if you love me, keep my commandments, you have to be doing these things Jesus commanded. Otherwise, you don't love him and you won't get to heaven. OK, the problem with that, though, is if people who say we must obey all of his commandments, don't, the, the problem is they don't obey all of Jesus commandments. And this is not really difficult to demonstrate. For example, one of Jesus commandments in John 9, 7 is to go wash at the pool in, in Siloam, Jesus quite clearly commanded, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. And later in that passage, Jesus relates to his physical blindness with sp the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. And you could say, well, if you haven't obeyed that commandment, you are spiritually blind, quote unquote. Uh, but then only a few verses before Jesus said, cut off your hand and pluck out your eyes. It, you know, in this same passage in Matthew 5, he quite clearly commanded listeners to offer your gift at the altar. So again, the people who say we must obey the commandments, when did they, off, you know, give their offering at the altar? Jesus quite clearly commanded Thomas to reach uh, your finger in the holes of my hands. Well, again, how many work salvationists have obeyed that commandment, you know? And then in Mark ten twenty one, Jesus quite clearly commanded the rich young man to sell whatsoever you have and give to the poor. Well, again, how many work salvationists own their own house and own a car? Some of them even a nice house, as I've demonstrated on my channel before. So, you know, the... Have they all obeyed that? Well, not necessarily, but Jesus quite clearly commanded these things. Okay. So whenever you hear somebody parrot John 14, 15, and then pluck out a load of random commandments, you know, right, if you love me, keep my commandments, deny yourself, pick up your cross. Jesus said, say no more. You know, these are all the things that they constantly repeat and parrot all the time. These are really the kinds of questions that ought to be asked. You know, when did you take a flight to Israel and wash your hands in the pool of Siloam and offer your gift at the altar? Because Jesus quite clearly commanded you to do that. Okay. When did you sell whatsoever possession you have and give it to the poor? When did you, and here's a good one, when did you pluck out your own eye? Because the people who love to quote it always have two eyes and two hands for some reason. Okay. Now, if you were to ask those questions and confront them with that, 
I mean, you probably won't get an answer if it's on social media. They'll probably just ignore you. But if you do get an answer, don't expect a very good one. You'll get something like, yeah, he didn't mean those commandments. You know, the, the cherry picking. OK, I cherry pick which commandments I like and which ones I don't like. Or you'll get, you know, well, those commandments don't apply to me. I'm not rich, so I don't have to sell anything. Well, well you know, this is the exceptions for my own disobedience. Well, yes, Jesus command those things, but I've got an excuse as to why I don't need to do it. You know, it's sort of like the people on YouTube who love to go around quoting James 2. You know, we have to have works for our salvation. We have to obey our commandments. You click on their channel and it's existed for eight years. No videos about the gospel. You know, well, what are you doing for your faith then? If you say that it needs works, do you know what I mean? But they always have exemptions for their disobedience or you know they'll, they'll come up with um there's no temple anymore so i can't offer a gift at the altar bingo we're finally getting somewhere you see that's now an impossible commandment right or you know they might say well those commandments were just for certain people in certain situations well again bingo okay now we're getting somewhere folks we have a context to the commandment okay so then uh, you know, someone recently urged uh, a bit of an anecdote. Somebody recently commented on my uh, repentance documentary and spent quite a long time writing. It was a very detailed comment because he was explaining, he was trying to explain the will of God for entering the kingdom based on Matthew 7. And he did a good job of pointing out all of these random verses in the New Testament. You know, this is the will of God that you abstain from fornication. This is the will of God here and all this kind of stuff. So basically that you have to do works for the to do the will of God for salvation. So, I, excuse me. So I asked him a simple question. Okay. All I asked him in my reply was, um, do you do all of the things in that list that you've just quoted? Or are you a worker of iniquity as well? And then instead of answering me, he deleted his comment. All right. So he just, he just never answered the question. So, um, so all of this stuff here then, and, and you know, the questions that we asked in the previous slide that we have for these legalists, um, kind of brings us on to, other problems if we're just going to say that it means all commandments okay following what we've just seen it, it, technically it's impossible to obey all of jesus commandments even for the most upright person just man there is you cannot obey the commandment to go wash in the pool of siloam and give your gift at the altar and really you can end up with a circular problem with this so for example jesus commanded his disciples how to pray saying give us our daily bread and forgive us our sins but he also said sin no more right so to obey this commandment to sin no more you must presumably not be following christ's model prayer but then if you are praying in the way that christ commanded well then you must not you know be obeying the commandment to sin no more if you were to take that as to, to mean all in any sin okay so you see a fundamental problem with there with trying to obey either commandment so by extension, if, if this, if we were to widen our interpretation of my commandments in John 14, 15 to all the commandments in the New Testament and not just the ones that Jesus himself directly gave. Well, if we can't even obey some of the commandments that came directly out of the mouth of Jesus, uh, then, you know, following his specific commandments fall apart. By extension of this, we can then assume that following all the commandments in the New Testament for salvation falls apart as well, because it, it must ultimately obviously include all of the things that, that Jesus said. Um, an additional point is that many people would say that some of Jesus' commandments, uh, such as go wash in the pool of Siloam, are very specific to people whom Jesus gave them and not applicable to us today. But then the problem with this claim is that these same people are not very consistent about which commandments they apply this, this rule to, okay? Well, it's it's technically impossible to obey all of the commandments G, uh, you know Jesus gave, even for the most just man in the world, apart from Jesus himself, because realistically it's not possible anymore to go wash in the pool of Siloam. As far as I'm aware, it was destroyed and filled in. You know, you can't offer your gift upon the altar; the temple was destroyed. You can't place your fingers in the holes of Jesus' hand; he's not physically here. So remember as well as, as we looked at the model prayer some of his examples uh, so sorry some of his commandments exist purely because of the fact that you don't perfectly obey his commandments so if the model prayer is saying forgive us lord our sins well unless you didn't sin there would be no point you know giving that prayer right so that that's a commandment that exists to deal with the fact that you don't obey all of the, the commandments now some people will dismiss the model prayer because that's only how we should pray not what we should pray but that doesn't change the fact that this is how jesus taught us to pray so you know it would still be a redundant way to teach you how to pray if we didn't need to pray this way so then 
we get on to the next point. Someone might say, well, okay, fine. It's impossible to obey all of the commandments for some of the reasons listed above. But but what about the commandments that we can technically obey? And obviously that's that's a good question. So, you know, we understand some of the commandments are technically impossible. What about the ones that are not impossible? We cause, Because we can't just brush them under the carpet, right? We've got to address them. We've got to answer them. So, for example, Jesus commanded his disciples uh, of going to his death on the cross. He said... If any man shall come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Well, you know, you ask the question, is it possible to obey this? Well, uh, Stephen in the Bible is an example of somebody who was uh, faithful to his own death, just as Jesus was. Uh, what about when Jesus commanded, pluck out your eye and cut off your hand? Well, again, indisputably, it is technically possible to obey this commandment. I mean, you can at least cut off one of your hands. I don't know how you'll do it without the other hand, you know, to do both hands. But you will notice, though, that every single person who loves to quote this always has two hands and two eyes himself. You know, I'm sure there's some reason behind that, you know. But uh, And then when Jesus you know, commanded, co commanded, sorry, put commended there, commanded sin no more. People will ask the question, why would he say this if he were not, if, if it were not possible to, to sin no more, in quite a literal sense of the word. Um, you know, he, he also emphasised preaching against sin multiple times uh, throughout his ministry, right? Well, the, the first problem is that the work salvation, I, I'm just going to call them legally, I don't know why I don't just use that term more often really, but the legalists will arbitrarily Pick and choose which commandments they decide you should be following. Okay, you see, they will take it upon themselves to, to to say that. Well, you don't need to obey the commandment to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, they may also say that this is a commandment only to the healed blind man in John nine. It's, it's not meant for you. But then they will arbitrarily decide that you do need to obey the commandment to go and sin no more. But but this really blatantly exposes their inconsistency because. This commandment was also specific to the woman caught in adultery in John 8 and to the healed man in John 5. It's not something verbatim anyway. Jesus didn't go around saying this to, you know, every, anybody and everybody. Uh, you know, he did not direct this phrase towards his disciples or all the multitudes. And you ought to ask yourself, what right really or what authority do they have to arbitrarily pick and choose which commandment they decide you need to be obeying. Because, you know, if we look at the different denominations that are out there, your Catholics, your Seventh-day Adventists, your Jehovah's Witnesses, and your different soteriological groups, your, your Calvinists, your Arminianists, sinless perfectionists, you know, all across the spectrum, they all agree to some extent, at least, that obeying Jesus' commandments is an intrinsic part of the salvation package in some way. But they all have different opinions and different lists as to the kind of things we ought to, you know, be doing for, for obeying. The Catholics have their list of go-to verses for the sacraments. The Protestants, Evangelicals and JWs have their list of go-to verses for the changed life or, you know, not making a lifestyle practice of sin or, or whatever they say. Uh, the SDAs have their Sabbath go-to verses. The Mormons have their go-to verses about having lots of children and all that stuff. And of course, the you know the, the sinless perfectionists have their quote mind verses from one John three memorized. Now, now, please don't understand me because I'm you know I do believe that we should obey Jesus' various commandments, such as do this, do not you know do not do that, to the extent that it's possible to obey them. And I believe that to some extent, at least, that's that's what Jesus is teaching his own disciples, as we will unravel later. However, what I'm saying is that these do's and don'ts, these various ones, are not necessary requirements to be saved onto eternal life. Okay, you know the only commandment I preach for eternal life is to believe on him because that's what the bible tells us over and over again to do for eternal life and this is an important distinction because if we believe the same gospel we we can to some extent agree to disagree on you know whether christians should abstain wholly from alcohol or not or you know whether we should attend church or not or whether we should do you know how we should do communion but when it comes to the gospel itself we, we can't really be at odds about how to get into heaven because the, the difference between going to heaven and hell it's too important and the, the context uh, you know sorry the the outcome is too dire if we get it wrong so that there's too much at stake to be uh, wrong about this okay and then well the second problem with this is that even the disciples themselves did not follow all of the commandments okay and you know are, are we really better than jesus's closest disciples were so you know uh, I, I mentioned this example earlier matthew 16 jesus told his disciples about going to his death peter tried to stop him at first 
and Jesus quite clearly told them to deny themselves, pick up their cross, etc. You know, following him or following him where? Well, he was telling them, you know, he's going to his death on the cross. But then, uh, as we explored in, in the previous study, when I did a video on John 13, in the final hours before Jesus' death, Peter commits to following him and even lay down his life for them. But but we know that he won't follow this through. And Jesus knew that Peter wouldn't follow it, uh, this through because it's documented later. His closest disciples forsook him. They, they did not deny themselves and pick up their cross and, and follow him, at least in the context of going to his death. So if his closest disciples didn't even follow Jesus, according to the passage that legalists love to quote, okay, you know, why do you, why should you think that you're better than they are? Follow, and so, you know, following Jesus' various commandments of do this, do that, beyond that of believing on him for salvation doesn't work, okay? Now, you can imagine how these street-screaming bozos would have dealt with the disciples and, and their failure to deny themselves, like, wash your hands, you filthy sinners! You know, Jesus warned you to deny yourself and pick up your cross, you're going to perish in hell because you wouldn't follow Jesus to the bitter end. You just love your sin too much and you fear men, Jesus will spew you out. You know, that's how they deal with the disciples, but really, this is not how we see Jesus dealing with his disciples rather you know what's he doing throughout john 14 he's comforting them okay he's exhorting them and this is despite the fact that he already knows their failures we saw this in the study of john 13 jesus already knows that the disciples are not going to fulfill his commandments to the bitter end okay but he comforts them he says don't let your heart be troubled i will not leave you comfortless you know i go to prepare a place for you in my father's house ask anything in my name and i will do it that the comforter uh, you know the father will send uh, in my name and teach you all things peace i leave with you this is all very very comforting statements you know to say that jesus already knows that the disciples didn't obey the commandment to deny themselves okay and you know loss of salvation crowd like to turn john 14 into a, a dire warning it's not a dire warning it's quite clearly a comfort because of the comforting language that, that jesus is using here okay so you know just to conclude what we've seen then the disciples themselves didn't obey the commandments to deny themselves pick up their cross and follow jesus jesus already knows about them and knows they will forsake him he is comforting them regardless in this chapter throughout john uh, 15 and 16 as well he said even in the previous chapter to peter you shall follow me afterwards uh, and actually uh, he ensured the lives of his 11 disciples would be protected which he does in john 18 8 to 9 so as to fulfill his saying then which you gave me i have lost none jesus protected his disciples from going to their death okay and actually in john 21 jesus implies to peter that peter will have a a long life because you know a lot of church tradition and you know catholic hearsay says that peter was martyred and then all the disciples were martyred at some point well, actually jesus seems to be committing that peter will, will have quite a long life according to john 21 and he, and he will glory god uh, in that kind of a life so even though jesus knows that they didn't deny themselves and pick up their cross he comforts them anyway and he even promises them a long life as well so unless you think that you're better than the disciples who spent lengths of time with jesus in person but you didn't you can very quickly see why trying to obey all of jesus's various rules and statutes doesn't work for salvation and how mercy warrants that jesus will save us despite failing to obey all of his commandments okay um, and another problem as well going back to those problems that i was mentioning is when we think of obeying jesus's commandments particularly in, in a salvation context most people and the legalists particularly only really focus on what jesus said well jesus said sin no more or jesus said deny yourself but they don't really ever consider why jesus actually commanded that or or the intended audience that, that he was actually commanding you know what why did he t tell us that and who was he talking to what's the point okay let's just go through a few a handful of verses a small handful and just look at the purpose okay so we have uh john 6 40 great verse and this is the will of him that sent me which ev that everyone which sees the son and believes on him may have everlasting life and i will raise him up at the last day so who is this verse addressed to well it's everyone so each individual which you know completes this action sees the son and believes on him 
Okay, what's the action required? What is the commandment? You know, if we're going to love Jesus and obey his commandments, well, what's the commandment here? It's believe on the son that you have seen. Okay, what's why? Why follow this command? What's the point of commanding this? Well, it's it's everlasting life. That's the reason that's given for this commandment. So if you love Jesus and you have to follow his commandments to love him, well, follow his commandments for the reason why he commanded them. And he gave this commandment that you would have everlasting life. That's why he commanded it. Okay, now uh, let's look at another verse. Um, John 8, 10, 11, the woman caught in adultery. So when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So, um, you know, who is it addressed to? Well, very specifically, it's the woman caught in adultery. That it, This is not, if, if any man come after me, or, you know, he that believeth on me. Very, very specific person that he's talking to here. Okay, this is a very situational commandment. What's the action required? Sin no more. Now, now people will say, well, why would Jesus say this if it weren't possible to sin no more? But, but they read that word sin and they apply it to all sins. But really, adultery is the only context of this saying because that that was the specific reason why this woman was being confronted here. Okay, we we don't know what kind of a lifestyle she lived, other than this particular act of adultery. Now, why why does Jesus command to go and sin no more? That thou shalt have everlasting life, not what Jesus said. That thou shalt not be condemned in hellfire, not what Jesus said. Her condemnation here was before. Men in a, in a physical death, she, she could have been stoned to death. Okay. That, that's the condemnation that Jesus is talking about here. And so that's the purpose of why Jesus says sin no more. You know, people love to quote this in a salvific context. Eternal life is not mentioned here. Salvation is not mentioned here. It's simply not addressed in this conversation. Okay. We, we don't know the salvific status of this woman. The passage doesn't tell us. Okay. So salvation has got nothing to do with go and sin no more. Uh, here's uh, another one. So uh, if we take John 13, 26 to 27, uh, this is when Jesus tells his disciples of his uh, betrayal. So uh, Jesus says, he it is to whom uh, I shall give a sop. And when I have dipped it, and he dipped the sop and he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, do quickly. So who is being commanded here? Judas Iscariot is the one being, this is a commandment addressed to Judas, okay? It's not addressed to all the disciples. Jesus is commanding Judas. What does Jesus command? What's the commandment addressed to Judas? That which you have premeditated, go do, go do that thing. Now, is that a commandment that all believers should be following? Not really, no, he shouldn't be betraying Jesus. But did Jesus command according to this scripture? Yes, he did. Why? Because he commanded it to Simon, and there's a reason. Uh, sorry, uh, Judas, not Simon. Judas is scary, and why? There's a very purpose. Now, it's it's not clearly explained from this verse itself, but holistically, as we saw from the previous study, Judas must betray Jesus to fulfil Scripture. Uh, obviously, you know, other believers do not fulfil Scripture in this context, so that's why Jesus is commanding it. So you wouldn't say to someone, well, you know, this betrayal of Jesus, go do it quickly, because, you know, he quite clearly commanded it, and you've got to obey his commandments if you love him. No, actually, you don't want to obey this commandment. This was a commandment for Judas, for the purpose of what Judas was going to do, Okay. And then uh, let's look at one more. So uh, Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. So who is being addressed? Well, it's you, plural. So we could apply that to whoever you are, every one of you, or at least believers, because Jesus is it's a sermon on the mount. He's talking to his disciples and a multitude of other people. So you, whoever you are, all of you, uh, what's the action? Well, the, the commandment is don't do your arms before men to be seen of them. Right. Okay. So we understand the commandment. Why? Why is Jesus telling us this? It's quite simple. If you, if, if you do uh, broadcast your arms before to be seen of men, you'll have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. And so again, you, you can't just say, well, if you love me, keep my commandments. You've got to be doing all of Jesus' commandments to be saved because being saved is not always the reason of his commandments. So if you're going to take non-salvation passages and make them a requirement for salvation you see very quickly then that you're not obeying jesus commandments because you're not doing them for the reason why jesus said to do them okay
And so reviewing all of our possible interpretations of my commandments so far then, well, we see very quickly it, it, it can't be obeying all of Jesus' commandments that he verbally gave in the Gospel account. This falls apart because some commandments are technically impossible. Obeying all of the Bible, or at least the New Testament commandments, fall apart for the same reason, because it includes all of these anyway. Obeying all of the commandments that Jesus gave specifically to his disciples falls apart because the disciples themselves didn't carry this out. Obeying a specific list of commandments falls apart because the reasoning behind the list is completely arbitrary and everybody keeps their own different list as to the things they say you should be obeying to to, to be safe. So the only, by process of elim elimination, we're left with a couple of interpretations. We, we could go with anything that Jesus commanded specifically in John 13 to 16. Or we could also say, is he being generalised rather than something specific? You know, is, is he just generally saying, keep my commandments? It's not about every specific thing okay and so we we've spent a lot of time in this study going through what john fourteen fifteen doesn't mean or rather can't mean in regards to his commandments well now we must answer what it does mean okay so we need to consider what is the purpose of jesus saying if you love me keep my commandments what kind of commandments is jesus referring to and, and what is and this might seem like a silly question at first, but what is meant by commandment in the first place? And this is important. How would the disciples themselves interpret what Jesus meant by this? And how did they perpetuate this teaching in their epistles? And the apostle or, you know, the disciple John gives us the best clues on this because as far as we know, he wrote the gospel account that contains this conversation and his epistles echo much of the same themes and terminology and keywords such as abide love keep commandments etc etc so you know his epistles are very similar to what jesus is talking about in john 14 okay so let, let's spend a bit of time thinking about this from the disciples perspective and particularly from john's perspective okay now when you read the bible you're reading with a lot of history com compressed into four very short somewhat repetitive accounts okay you know the gospel of matthew mark Luke and John. Um, sorry, I think my taskbar has cut off the text, but what that's saying is this timeline isn't p perfectly accurate. You know, don't quote me on these dates. It, it's just for illustration purposes. So, you know, we anticipate that Jesus started his ministry probably AD 31, if, you know, if all the dates tie up with when he was actually uh, born. We don't know for sure if, you know, how exactly AD ties up. So long before that, you know, you got the birth and the childhood of Jesus. Um, Sometime after he starts his ministry, he recruits John. We've then got, you know, he gives the Sermon on the Mount. He tells his disciples about his death. He heads up to Jerusalem uh, so that Jesus can be betrayed. Uh, Christ is put to death on the Passover. So there were a few years or at least a few months between some of these different events. But they're all compressed into, you know, short gospel accounts, right? So when you hear the words, uh, you know, keep my commandments you you personally you might immediately think of some random passages in the gospels where where jesus commanded things and apply that to the context because from your perspective those things only happened a few uh you know pages ago you know it said follow me be fishers of men you flip the page it says pluck out your eye you flip the page it says deny yourself you flip a few more pages it says sin no more you flip a, a few pages and it says if you love me keep my commandments and in your bible you know these are all very close together um all of these things that i've i've popped on there okay but this is it's not really fair to apply that perspective to the disciples perspective because remember that for them these conversations were separated by months seasons and years okay so from john's perspective or the disciples perspective when jesus says keep my commandments a lot of time has passed between these various other commandments you know from the perspective of the disciples so uh, many other things happened between these events that are not documented john himself said that the earth could not contain all the books if everything were written about jesus so now imagine then that you were one of the disciples um, in the intimate setting of John 14, you're in a very small, intimate setting with only 10 other of Jesus's closest disciples, because uh, Judas has already left by this point. Uh, this conversation is, you know, it's not open to the masses. Jesus isn't preaching to the multitudes. Christ's conversation with you is somewhat very personal. It's very precious to you. You hear these words, if you love me, keep my commandments, and naturally you ponder what this means. Okay? Okay. 
Well, your first reaction is probably not to think about some commandments that Jesus said over two or three years ago, okay? To to a large group of people as well, in a completely different location, in a setting which is not very intimate and personal to you. For example, the, the commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you're probably not going to think about what Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery when this probably happened several months or, or years ago jesus said it very specifically to that person in a, in a very uncomfortable public setting you're probably not going to think about what jesus said to the scribes and pharisees who rejected him because the way that jesus dealt with the pharisees is very different to how jesus deals with you as a disciple and he constantly upbraided them left right and center and his rebukings don't really apply to you as one of his loyal disciples instead given the close quiet intimate personal setting between you jesus and um, the other 10 of the closest disciples your first thoughts regarding his commandments would would probably be something like these so what is jesus saying to me or in front of me right now during this conversation oh you know after the last supper prior to his betrayal and again you know you're reading it in a couple of chapters but for them you know this a couple of hours pass during this whole event at least in summary john 13 17 and also the synoptic accounts of the last supper essentially this is all one event so that's probably one of the first things that springs to your mind and at a stretch, you may also think, well, what has Jesus said recently to only the 12 of us, if, if you include Judas, when we came up to Jerusalem? Because since we've come up to Jerusalem so that Jesus can be betrayed, Jesus has no longer been speaking to the masses. He's no longer taught in the synagogues or in public places, and he's no longer preaching to non-disciples. So you, you've been sitting on the Mount of Olives discussing the fall down of the temple and the signs of the end. Uh, you've been coming up to Jerusalem to be betrayed. Well, sorry, Jesus has uh, staying in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper and preparing the, the Passover meal. That's the most recent stuff that you would really think about if, if you know if you were pondering this. So, why would you think that as as one of his eleven disciples? Well, these recent conversations, settings, and commandments are fresh in your memory. Jesus is only speaking to you and his closest other disciples. All these events are leading up to the final hours of Jesus' life, and this is the last chance that Jesus has to, for you to receive some of his most important teachings. You need to be comforted and exhorted while Jesus goes to his death, because perhaps you're not really ready in your heart to accept this yet. Okay. Uh, the Passover is at hand. Everybody's getting ready or staying at home. You are going to Jerusalem with Jesus, so there's a very specific purpose that uh, can be carried out. This is no longer an appropriate time to be preaching to the masses about various commandments, uh, such as in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Now that we've imagined being one of Jesus' disciples, let, let's take off our Imagine Being a Disciple hat and now think about your perspective as a believer who, because you weren't a first-hand witness to this conversation. So all you've got to go on is what John and the other disciples have handed down to you. That's all you know about this conversation. So how has John the disciple equipped you and taught you regarding his intimate conversation with Jesus because he was a first-hand witness? By documenting this conversation in his written account, John assumes the responsibility to pass on what Christ taught him to you as a non-witness. Okay, if John didn't pass something down to you in his gospel account, he may not consider it important enough to fulfill his obligations. All right. So, so following that, then can consider that John recorded this conversation in his gospel account. So you, you only know that Jesus said, keep my commandments because it was John who made the effort to write this down in his gospel account for you. So John needs to take the responsibility to ensure that you can sufficiently understand this conversation. Consider what else did John tell you in his gospel before this conversation? Well, repeatedly throughout his gospel, John has emphasized conversations that Jesus had with unsaved people to tell them how to be saved onto eternal life. John has taken it upon himself to write down conversations where Jesus is telling people what to do for it to, to have eternal life. John even writes that the overall purpose of his book is that you would believe and have everlasting life. 
If it doesn't sufficiently meet this requirement, well, well John didn't meet the goal that he set out to achieve. Now, uh, John's gospel frequently repeats the same theme over and over again. Believe, have eternal life. Believe, have eternal life. Believe, have eternal life. Or words to that effect. And this is what he's been setting us up for. Okay? Now consider what John did not record in his gospel account. Though so, um, he, he didn't find it necessary to record many of Jesus' key teachings on moral issues. Now Jesus gave plenty of commandments about the do's and the don'ts, and yet John's gospel is noticeably absent on those teachings compared to Matthew, Mark and Luke. Okay. Jesus did not, uh, sorry, John did not deem it necessary in his gospel to record the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus delves into many moral teachings and issues, new com uh, many commandments. He didn't deem it necessary to record the sending out of the Twelve, where Jesus gives uh, several commandments, even specifically to the disciples present in the meeting at John 14, because, you know, that that's who he was giving that, that kind of stuff to. Uh, many of the parables that Jesus gave. Now, now John's recording of parables are fairly minimal. And really, a lot of what we might call parables in John's gospel are actually more like analogies, uh, sorry, analogies and allegories rather than parables. And uh, Jesus is teaching on the greatest commandments on the Old Testament law, again, noticeably absent from John's gospel. And even teachings on the, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, which, which does have strong overlaps with eternal life that even that's fairly minimal in john's gospel if you look at the word kingdom in the concordance there's very very few mentions in john's gospel even though it, it does have overlap with eternal life and so uh, the, and the most succinct teaching in john's gospel concerning moral issues are sin no more which in john 5 we don't even really know what the sin was anyway and in john 8 it, it was very specific to, to one person okay so you might then think, well, well, what about Matthew, Levi, or you know, Levi, because he he was one of the disciples present, and it's reckoned that that he wrote the the Gospel of of Matthew. Well, unlike John, Matthew does go into great detail in his Gospel account about all of these issues, which John's Gospel declines to, and he was present in the conversation of John thirteen sixteen, presumably. So, would Matthew have interpreted "Keep my commandments" as concerning? all of these things that he writes about. Well, quite possibly, we, we cannot ignore this. However, it's important to point out that Matthew did not seem it necessary to record this conversation of John 13, 16 in his gospel account. Matthew's gospel skips from the Last Supper and the foretelling of G uh, sorry Peter's denial straight to Gethsemane. He did not record Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so Matthew hasn't really set us up for that saying, whereas John's gospel has like all the responsibility has stayed with John to set us up for what Jesus means by this statement because only he makes the effort to record Jesus as saying it some of Matthew Matthew's details lead up to this saying but he doesn't set us up for it deliberately as John does now you might think well yeah but so what if John doesn't mention his gospel it's still mentioned in the other gospels anyway but remember that the bible didn't just spring up out of thin air with the new testament as a whole book ready in one go okay different letters were compiled at different times independently by different people in different places and they all gradually had to be joined together so you know we, we can't really necessarily say that john and levi were both in lockstep when they wrote their gospel accounts you know they, they were probably very independently written not entirely aware of each other's accounts yet with very different views in mind okay so in conclusion john has not given us the foresight in his own gospel account to make a direct connection between the various moral statutes of Jesus and the keeping of his commandments in John 14. He hasn't married those two things up. So we must ask ourselves as we try to interpret this, should we make a connection between the keeping of the commandments in John 14 and any commandments in the Bible? Or, you know, in other words, any time the Bible uses the word commandment, should we bridge such verses? Um, even though John doesn't make a connection between moral commandments and John 14, 15 in foresight, do we have it in hindsight? Should we look at the epistles and see how the disciples pointed back to John 14, 15? Um, does Jesus give us any helpful clues in John 13, 16 as to what commandments uh, he is even referring to? Normally, if you wanted to know how a word in the Bible is used, it does help to go through the concordance and look at it in different contexts, like the word repentance, for instance. The problem is, though, if we look up every instance of the word commandment, 
uh, and make a connection. Uh, the, the, there will be a few problems by doing this. First of all, the specific com word commandment alone appears more than 160 times in the King James, at least. And that's, that count is not including commanded or command. And it's in many different contexts, and many of them actually do have absolutely nothing to do with Jesus' commandment, because it might be one man commanded another man, such and such. Um, it's a very generic verb. It has lots of different applications where it's used. It, so it's not really salvific terminology like salvation or justification or repentance or faith. Um, there are many other words that are synonymous with the word commandment, such as law, statute. So trying to extend our search to these passages as well that just becomes messy and sends us off in all kinds of different directions, really. And any time Jesus tells somebody to do something, this is a commandment because that's what the word means. Even if the Bible doesn't have to use the word for a commandment. And finally, we know we've already seen in this in the study so far, some of Jesus' commandments are at this point literally impossible or very specific to uh, certain persons. And so, um, unfortunately, while looking up the concordance is usually very helpful in defining words or, or concepts of commandment, it, it, it's so abundant, really, though, it, it doesn't really help us define it specifically for John fourteen fifteen. We need something more specific. So let's review again the, the words that Jesus used in, in the wider conversation. And then later we'll, we'll pick up on John's writings in the epistles as the closest match to the terminology used in John 14. So in John 14, if you look between verses 21 24. Notice the interchangeability between my commandments and my words or my sayings. He, he doesn't use terminology such as my laws or my statutes. Um, and it, it's important. He also doesn't men, mention sin or trespasses as being the context of what he is commanding here. Okay. And herein lies a fundamental problem. If the legalists insist that keeping his commandments is all about turning from sin and walking in righteousness and not sinning, well then, why is sin not mentioned as the immediate context surrounding this statement? If you look at the conversation in John thirteen sixteen, where is Jesus warning the disciples about falling into the routine sins of the flesh here. There are no warnings against alcohol, the adultery, the fornication, the idolatry. Why isn't Jesus warning his disciples about these things in this chapter if that's what's really meant by it? Okay. And actually, pushing on that further, where is Jesus even warning about false doctrines here? Now, there is uh, an application to doctrine. We will explore that later. But it, it's not immediately obvious, though. Um, he will warn them about being persecuted in John 15 by the world that does not know him or the Father. But he, we don't really, he doesn't really delve into their erroneous teachings or their fables, though. And where is Jesus warning about loving the things of this world here? Again, no no warning against the love of money or political affairs of the world or being too focused about their worldly reputation. Again, Jesus is not discussing these things in this dialogue. He's not using this stuff to surround the context of keep my commandments. Now, Jesus does mention sin later in chapter 15 and 16, but not in reference to the disciples falling back into sin, but rather people who reject Christ. Now, why did they sin? Well, it's because they saw Jesus' works, but didn't believe him. Sins of the flesh are not mentioned here. So notice why they, those who rejected Christ, had sin. Because it's, well, it's because they saw Jesus' works, and yet still, and particularly the Pharisees, hated him and sought to kill him without a cause. Okay, so that, you know, you want to apply that to all sin, but there's a very specific reason why they're being con condemned by sin. Okay, it's not because of a lack of repentance over those sins being mentioned here. And then you fast forward, carry on reading, and you get down to John 16 in verse 9, that the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin. And why does he do it? Well, it's because they believe not on me. It's not because they won't put down the alcohol or throw, put the pornography on the fire. The very reason they're being reproved of sin is for not believing. Okay, that that's the reason why. Or it's not, you know, their failure to turn their life around or something like that. Um, so borrowing what we have just seen from John 14, uh, sorry, John 15 and 16 helps us to understand with a bit more clarity about John 14. Notice some, some important things here. So number one, in, in John 14, 21, we see that loving Jesus is equated with those who keep his commandments. Now, there's a bit of a problem when, when you say the opposite of loving Jesus, because you could say the opposite is not loving Jesus, or you could say that the opposite is hating Jesus. But they're two very different opposites, though. And so 
those who hate Jesus, according to John fifteen twenty four, it's applied to those who saw Jesus' works and hates him without a cause. And earlier verses would suggest that Jesus groups these persecutors as being the world. So, you know, this in this context, those who hate Jesus, it's not those who believe in Jesus but just won't turn from their habitual sins. That's not the context that Jesus gives us. Jesus gives us those who hate Jesus without a cause and seek to put him to death when they have seen his works. Those are the types of people that hate Jesus. And so those are the types of people in opposition to those who love Jesus. Okay. And the, well, third point is just that we see that the world, the same types of people who uh, discussed in the latter half of John 15, they will be reproved of sin very specifically for not believing on Jesus. It's not that they would believe but wouldn't turn their lives around and clean up their act. It's because they didn't believe on Jesus. That's why they're being reproved of their sin. Okay. So just to just to help illustrate this with with kind of a chart, we have a very specific dichotomy here in John fourteen to sixteen. On the one hand we have those who love Christ, those who love Christ and keep his commandments. And on the opposite side we have those who hate Christ, which are those who see Christ's works hate him without a cause and do not believe on him okay the the idea of if you're trying to fit somewhere in like false believers so-called who sort of believe christ but won't obey all of his commandments which means to turn from sins apparently well we can't really fit this person in the dichotomy because we don't really have an example in this dialogue of somebody who does believe the gospel but is laden with unrepentant sins now i know some would argue that the early half of john 15 answers that issue but the problem with saying that is sin is still not directly mentioned as the main teaching of keeping his commandments anyhow and it's problematic to say that somebody who does not abide in christ is counted a believer but that will have to you know john 15 is going to have to wait to the next video unfortunately just because you know there's so much material covered on john 14 in this video so we see the flawed logic here in making keep my commandments all about turning from sin and not falling back into sin and obeying all of these various moral do not do's and do nots when sin is not a fundamental part of this discussion and if we consider the lives and shortcomings of the 11 disciples in the four gospels we see examples of their fiery tempers we see examples of their lack of bravery we see examples of their lack of understanding particularly here in john 13 to 16 we see examples of their weak faith we see examples of their desire to be great and to sit beside jesus throne we see the examples of their lacking mercy and patience on children and the sick by keeping them away from jesus we see examples of peter clinging on to jesus's physical presence not wanting to let him go to his death on the cross but we don't have examples of the disciples being addicted to much wine or their penchant for prostitutes or kleptomania or murder or envies or, you know, eating meat sacrificed onto idols and engaging in witchcraft. We don't see examples of the disciples struggling with this kind of thing. So it doesn't make sense why Jesus would tell the disciples to remain in his love by abstaining from these various sins of the flesh when these not only not being spoken about in this dialogue but they're not what the disciples are obviously in danger of falling into when jesus was about to go onto his death in the cross his disciples are in danger of falling away from their confidence in him and what he would accomplish being discouraged by his death and not understanding why he must go and do this you know even after his resurrection we have the story of doubting thomas they're in danger of not being willing to risk the persecution that might overtake them if they preach Christ. And this was manifest as they denied and forsook Christ as he was put to death. They're in danger of failing to grasp the interchangeable relationship between the Father and the Son. And so when you understand all of this, it really helps us to understand what is even meant by abide in me in John 15 when we do our next study. And in fact, many of the things that Jesus is speaking about here to his disciples where they were in danger of these things there were many jews before them that did stumble on these things many jews started their initial faith but then did not continue in him because they they lost their first confidence an example for example uh, you could say see the disciples who walk no more with him in john chapter 6 uh, many jews did not want to face persecution so they either didn't go all the way to believe in christ or, or they believed but not did uh, they did not confess him publicly as for example john chapter 12 uh, many jews did not grasp the relationship between jesus as the son and god the father which jesus spoke about many times and many jews did not understand the significance behind jesus going to his death for example 
John 8, 22. And so these are the kinds of things where Jesus needs to insist to his disciples that they continue in his love and abide in him, because these are ultimately the kind of things where people actually stumbled in regards to their uh, faith in Christ. And here's something interesting, because remember earlier we, I posed the question, what, what does Jesus even mean by commandment? Well, here's something else to notice from our brief look at John 15. Notice how Jesus uses the word law and how this com uh, applies to the word commandment. So in John 15, 25, it says, but this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So notice what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say it's written in their prophecies or it's as it is written by the prophets. He doesn't say it is written in God's law or it is written in the law. Instead, he says it is written in their law. Now, what Jesus is quoting here is not really a law in the conventional biblical sense of the word. Saying it, it is their law implies that this verse either belongs to them or it is about or towards them not belonging to or speaking towards Christ. And he uses the word law for what is actually prophetic rather than legal, which suggests a wider application to the meaning of law and so by extension um, commandments. And a good example of this in our, in our own vernacular is, uh, you know, a practical example we can see today. When, when thinking of judicial law, we think of moral law, just as we see in the Bible. There is a law in place and if you break this law, and you can choose to break this law, then there is a punishment or a consequence associated with breaking this law, right? Whereas if we think about the laws of physics, we, we don't think of law in this same way. The, the laws of physics are actually unbreakable. You, you cannot choose to create unlimited energy and then suffer the consequences for it. The only consequences in physical laws still obey the laws of physics. For example, you know, mix this chemical with that chemical and get a dangerous explosion. So although the laws of physics can be used for immoral purposes, according to judicial law, the laws of physics themselves are not, they're, they're morally neutral, okay? They're not really a, a matter of right and wrong. It's just a matter of that which must be obeyed and come to pass. So this is appears to be how we see Jesus using the word law here, as something that is not a moral command to do this or to do that, but rather something is written and must be fulfilled, and it can't be broken any more than physical laws, otherwise the scripture would be broken. So in theory, this could apply to commandments. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, this word appears abundantly in the Bible in various forms, and most of the time it does mean a directive, but there is, is an odd occasion where it's actually declarative, mostly in the Psalms. Um, and, and I ought not to labour this point, you know, we don't want to sort of go off on a tangent here, but there's just a couple of Psalms that you can see on the screen here where the context is declarative. Um, it, it's not really anything to do with things you must do or right from wrong it, it, you know like for example when it says your testimonies that you have commanded well a, te a testimony is a witness declaration rather than a commandment in, in in its original sense and yet it says you have commanded okay um and, and so on and so on and, you know when god declared creation there was nothing before creation so there's no direct object of his commandment it's just god spoke and nothing became something essentially he spoke things into existence he commanded and they were created. So the point that I'm trying to get across here is that Jesus, Jesus' commandments here are not just about thou shalt do's and thou shalt not's. It's really every bit, if not more so, to do with his teachings and his doctrines and other instructions that are not moral issues or fleshly sin issues. And we can see that from John 14 itself. So, for example, in verse 21, we see that keeping Christ's commandments are interchangeable with keeping his words and keeping his sayings. He doesn't use the phraseology, keeping my laws or keeping my instructions. And so his commandments here have everything to do with as much as what he says and the words that he has spoken. And so keeping them in that regard is equivalent to holding on to them and remembering them, which is exactly what the Holy Ghost is explained to help them do in verse uh, 26. So, you know, we flip, we flip, we go to verses 25 and 26. Uh, this is important here because Jesus points out that these things Jesus has spoken unto them while yet being present. And so verse 25 seems to suggest that the commandments here that Jesus is talking about are somewhat specific to this conversation and not inclusive of everything he ever said throughout his ministry. However, eventually the Holy Spirit will bring all things 
to remembrance whatsoever Christ has said to them. And of course, the Holy Spirit will come after Jesus when he resurrects and, and breathes on them and, and then leaves them. Okay. So for those of you that like visuals, here's a, a visual illustration of how you could interpret verses 25 and 26. So th this particular conversation in uh, John 13 to 16, and maybe some of the final things leading up to it before Jesus goes to his death on the cross, these are the things that I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you, you know, yet, because he, he's almost not going to be. Once we get after his resurrection, Christ is no longer present, so he sends the Holy Ghost in his place, and he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And obviously that would presumably include things that Jesus said to the disciples spanning over several years that at this point they may not remember all of that yet. Okay, so hopefully that's a good illustration that, that helps you to make sense of what that means. So let's review then what Jesus has been talking about in this conversation and goes on to say, as the context of Jesus's commandments, his sayings, his words, in other words, what are the commandments in this conversation that he's saying the disciples must keep? Well, um, in the previous chapter in verse 14, he, the commandment was to wash one another's feet. And so notice how this is nothing to do with sins of the flesh and the like. And this ties in with verse 34 as well. Um, later then, a few verses later in uh, verse 19, he says, you may believe that I am he. So again, what's the commandment? Believe that I am he. Nothing to do with sins in the flesh of the like. This commandment is about solidifying their confidence in their belief in Christ. Um, then a few verses later in 34 to 35, the, the new commandment that I give unto you is that you love one another as I have loved you. Um, so again, there's the commandment. Now, this is arguably a moral command of sorts, but it, it's very specific in scope. It's referring to how the disciples treat each other in the absence of Christ to unite them. And then notice how a particular reason for this commandment is given. Notice that eternal life is not the state of the reason. It's that other men shall see you and know that you are my disciples if you love one another that that's the goal of him commanding that okay and then at the beginning of verse one in this chapter john 14 we saw believe also in me there's the commandment nothing to do with sins of the flesh and the like it's about confidence in christ who he is having faith in who he is jump down to verse 11 again what's the commandment believe me that i am in the father and the father is in me believe me for the very work's sake there's the commandment once again it has to do with their faith in who Christ is in relation to the Father, not a sin of the flesh issue. Um, you get to verses 13 to 14. Again, uh, it's, here's the commandment. If you shall ask anything in my name, uh, I will... Uh, sorry, I, I must have forgot to type up the notes for that, but uh, it's arguably not necessarily a commandment, but there, there's the commandment if there is anything. Ask in my name, and if you ask in my name, I will do it. Okay, so sorry for missing out the description there. Um, John 15, we get to the next chapter, we get to verse 4. What's the commandment? Abide in me, and I in you. What does abide mean? To continue, to remain, to stay in Christ. Which, you know, remember this will be important after Christ is no longer physically with them. They will have to continue in him nonetheless. We get to uh, chapter 15, verse 9. Continue in my love. There's the commandment. Something very specific, not a sin issue. Okay. Uh, and then again, he re-emphasizes what he said earlier when he said, uh, this is my commandment that you love one another. Well, he's already told them to love one another in chapter 13. So he's telling them again. Verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. So once again, repeating a very specific theme here, not talking about sins of the flesh. And then here's another commandment. You shall also bear witness. So there's the commandment. Once again, not a sin issue, but they will bear witness to the sayings, the words, and the who Jesus is, being of the Father. Okay. You then go to chapter 16 and you get to verse 4. What's the commandment? You remember that I told you of them. Again, not, not a sin issue of the flesh issue. They need to remember the things that Jesus has taught and keep his words, which the Holy Ghost will remind them to do. Fast forward to verse 23. Again, repeat of what we already saw in John 14. Here's the commandment. Ask in my father's name. And if you do that, he will give it unto you. Okay. Nothing to do with sins of the flesh. It's an encouragement that they will receive help after Jesus departs from them. And then uh, the final commandment then, be of good cheer. So that's, you know, an exhortation. Everything's going to be okay. No mention of the sins of the flesh in any of these commandments. But is Jesus telling them to do these things? Yes, he is. 
So you you start to see the big problem here because all all the legalists want to make these commandments in this chapter all about sin and how holy you are by your actions when for the most part that appears to have absolutely nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about in this conversation you know Jesus isn't telling his disciples here to abstain from sins of the flesh because that's not where they stumbled he's telling them not to lose heart to know and believe that he is the father and more crucially to love one another okay you know and this is even though Christ is departing from them they need to continue in the faith continue in his love for them ask things in his name so that they may receive those things and the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit will bring other things to their remembrance so let's try and think of this visually these are the things that I have spoken on to you being yet with you if you love me keep my commandments well in this conversation what has Jesus commanded love one another and wash each other's feet be of good cheer continue in my love and abide in me ask anything in my name and I will do it believe that I am in, in the father and the father is in me and then the Holy Ghost will bring all things to your remembrance and so you know the Holy Ghost will remind them of all the things that Jesus taught them and they will pass this teaching to us through their epistles and their gospel accounts so you know John is telling us what Jesus told him in this conversation in his gospel he then writes his epistles where he picks up on these same themes uh, Matthew's gospel tells us about some of the other stuff that Jesus said that John didn't tell us uh, Peter's epistle although Peter perhaps doesn't pick up all of the same themes from the gospels we presume that Peter got his teaching from somewhere okay we assume that Jesus probably taught him a lot of the things that he's teaching us in his epistle same thing with James same thing with Jude okay and so in summary we we now understand a more clear meaning behind if you love me keep my commandments or he who keeps my commandments and words and sayings it is he that loves me uh you know that's what he's saying to the 11 disciples so what what does he mean by all that well hold on to your faith in christ be of good cheer believe that he is in the father and the father is in him continue in the love that he has for you don't be afraid of the persecution that will come because you hold on to your faith and preach christ the holy spirit will be sent to comfort you hold on to jesus's words and sayings and the holy ghost will bring these words into your remembrance and so obviously the doctrines and jesus's moral teachings are a part of what jesus said they are a part of his words so obviously do not discard those words hold on to them and pass them on well the disciples did this because in their epistles they themselves taught moral issues you know they taught don't do this sin don't do that sin walk in this path walk in that path etc uh, you know and they preserved christ's words for us today that we have hundreds of years later love one another just as christ has loved you when christ departs and he's not there to lead you anymore you know don't descend into devouring one another and trying to establish your own kingdoms and be the, the right hand of jesus to sit by his throne you know love one another as servants all 11 of you you know do not desire personal greatness above the other disciples um, so we can then see following all what we've seen we can then see how the disciple john particularly carries this forward into his epistles because he's going to pick up on a lot of the same themes that jesus talked about so you know jesus said to john in john 13 34 to 35 a new commandment i give unto you that you love one another as i have loved you by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another that's what jesus talking to john what does john say to us in his epistles well very similar theme just as jesus told him to love one another he says to us love one another okay just as jesus said a new commandment he says he gave us commandment jesus gave us commandment and that's exactly what happened in john 14 uh that's in 1 john 3 23 there that i've uh, got that verse from and then you go to 1 john 5 1 and 2 and again repeating a lot of these same themes keep his commandments well one of his key commandments was that love one another and he picks upon this same theme everyone that loves him that begat loves him that is begotten of him if i'm begat of god and you're begat of god we are commanded here to love one another because we are brothers in christ and just as jesus said to the disciples by doing this all men shall know that you are my disciples so likewise john says about us collectively by this we know that we love the children of god when we love god okay so here's what it's about it's about knowing what's what's about knowing who's who so notice that the key command here is to love one another and this is as brethren who are children of the same god it's it's not in the context of your neighbor or your fellow citizen as it was in the old testament law 
And this is why, you know, if you want a reason why Jesus calls it a new commandment, quote unquote. And so this is how we identify each other as children of God and how men identify the disciples of Christ, because this is interchangeable with loving God, according to uh, 1 John 5. Um, and notice also, that, that, again, the reason for loving one another in these verses. Loving one another is not a commandment to become a child begotten of God, because this starts by believing the Christ. You know, it even says 1 John 5, 1, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, as it says in 1 John 23. So there's the commandment to become a son of God, believe on Jesus Christ. But loving one another is how the children of God identify each other and how all men identify the disciples of Christ. Okay, so yes, there was an immediate context to the disciples themselves, but we can apply this to us today as well in, in a different context. So let's again, let's use an illustration. This is an illustration so that we can see and understand this more clearly. The children of God, we know that we are. OK, because God begets this guy, God begets that guy, God begets that guy and God begets that guy. And so that guy loves that guy and that guy loves that guy, that guy loves that guy and that guy loves that guy. And they love each other and they love each other and so on and so on and so on. And so all the men, all the world shall know that we are. They, they see this and they know you are my disciples. OK, this is how we are to be identified. That's the purpose of why he's giving this commandment. Um, here is another example of John carrying forward the conversation in John uh, 14, uh, sorry, well, 13 through to 16, into his epistle. So uh, Jesus saying to John, the new commandment, and again, we go forward to 2 John 1, not as though I wrote a new commandment, but that which we had from the beginning, because Jesus gave that from, you know, all the way back from uh, John 13, that we love one another, just as Christ told John to do. So is John telling us to do that same thing, okay? And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. What have you heard from the beginning? That you should love one another, okay? Now, again, another reason, okay? So Jesus said to John, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, okay? We then get to John, and what does John say? This He says, there are many deceivers entered into the world. And, and how are they deceiving? Well, they don't confess that Christ is come in the flesh, this is a deceiver. This is an antichrist. So this is, and it, although it perhaps, you know, doesn't use the word, you know, love in that verse, it's obviously sandwiched next to a verse that does. So, you know, we've got those who love Christ and the deceivers, the antichrist. And what is the problem with the deceivers and the antichrist? It's that they don't confess that Jesus is come in the flesh. That's a very, very specific problem. It's got nothing to do with people. Well, they do confess in the uh, Christ, in, in, you know, he came in the flesh, but you know, they, they, are, they just, teach all of these things about sin and carry on sinning. No, that's not the problem here. That's not what John is describing there. And so we then understand what, when when Jesus will get to John 15, and when we do a study on this, we'll understand what he means. The word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me and I in you. And so what does John say about that? Whosoever transgresses and abides not in, abides in what? The doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So how is John, in his second epistle there, defining abiding in Christ? If we're to link that word abiding there, it's the doctrine. It's about who Christ is, not about all the works that you do. It's about who Christ is. So that's what's being discussed here. And again, just as uh, Jesus said to John, by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That was in John 13. John carries a similar thing forward into his, John helps us define this. If anyone comes on to you and does not bring this doctrine, and it's about the doctrine, don't receive him into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. So Jesus told John to love one another. John's telling us not to let somebody in our house and don't bid them Godspeed. That sounds like the opposite of love, but what's the criteria? They don't carry the doctrine. So part of loving one another then carrying the doctrine. So there's a lot of important contextual information here that, that John gives us in regards to the kind of things that Jesus was talking about and, and how John interpreted that. So, you know, we, we see that there are, um, in, in uh, 2 John 1, 7, there are plural, because it says commandments with an S on the end. So there's, a, there's plural commandments. So there's obviously more than one commandment uh, to, that we're expected to obey. But one commandment here is being particularly emphasised in the second epistle, at least, and that, that's to 
love one another um, and, and carry forward, you know, remain in the doctrine uh, to, is, is another important commandment being emphasised. So, you know, it's either about loving one another or it's about the doctrine. In, in John's first epistle, it was either about loving one another or it was about believing on the Christ. So abiding in Christ, obeying his commandments, it all has to do with understanding who Jesus is and continuing in that truth. So the people that say that Christ didn't come in the flesh, they don't carry forward that truth. They don't abide in Christ. They don't remain in Christ in that context. Okay. So, uh, you know, we can bridge these two together because we, what we don't want to do is just arbitrarily pick a passage in the Bible and say, well, that's what Jesus was talking about over there because that's what the work salvation crowd do. But notice how we, we've got the terminology here. Abide, just as it says, um, abide in John 15. We've got commandments. We've got commandment and we've got love one another, love one another. So, you know, all these consistent themes to prove that this passage is related to this passage. We're not just making an arbitrary connection here. OK. So, it, 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 so it's quite important then that John ties this in with the doctrine of Christ, because John is applying it to who Christ is. You know, it's not about sins that you've turned from or the life that you know, you've turned your life around or, or any of that stuff. This is all about Jesus. It's about who he is. It's about what he's done. And so uh, when we see, because some people will pluck things out of either the Gospel of John or the Epistles of John um, about like he who does good or he who does righteousness and he cannot sin. They always want to make it about how obedient you're following the, the moral do's and do nots when actually John himself relates it more to actually who Jesus is rather than how good of a Christian you are. And so, um, yeah, and so, you know, ending that off, then we, we have the, the context of those who we are supposed to love and identify. When Christ says, love one another as I have loved you, who is he telling you um, to love? It's it's the children of God. Um, you know, you can't just imply it. Because some people on YouTube get a bit annoyed with uh, people like me and plenty of other people, whether true or false, that... Um, if we call somebody else out, if we label somebody else a false prophet and we criticise them and we mark them, as I've done with Epiusio and Apologetics, uh, I've done with Seeking the One Saved and he, he's done the inverse on me as well, um, you know, they, they, they come out with, well, we're supposed to love one another and this isn't very good for you Christians to be behaving like this. But there there is a very specific thing here. I'm supposed to love those who bring the doctrine, okay? And so if, you know, if Jesus says... I should lose nothing regarding those that I've given eternal life to. And EPUC on apologetics or seeking the one safe says, well, no, actually he will lose some because he lost Judas or words to that effect. Well, they're not abiding in the words that Jesus spoke. They're not abiding in his sayings. And so they're not the people that Christ is telling me to love one another as I have, um, you know, loved you. Okay. And even when we wind back in John's gospel, um, and you can also perhaps tie this in with Romans 11, where Paul talks about this is, why did the Jews stumble? Well, ultimately, they stumbled on unbelief. You see, the problem that Jesus had with the Jews wasn't that there were loads of Jews who were just so moved by his message, but they wouldn't pour the drink down and they wouldn't, you know, throw all their naughty drawings away. The problem is, is that the Jews didn't believe on him when that's what they told him to do. And so, you know, they're the kind of people that would say the Holy One, the Messiah of Israel, is not come in the flesh. That is an example of the deceiver, the people who don't continue in this doctrine, the kinds of people that John is talking about. Now, now, following that, some people will ask, and I, I'm only addressing this because some people might ask this. Okay, well, even though loving one another isn't how I become a child of God, is it how I sustain my relationship as a child of God? And again, this comes from the idea of maintaining salvation, um, that, you know, faith produces works or something like that. So we have to justify it with obedience. But they have to get around the faith without works versus so that they they'll say things like we don't earn salvation but we keep it or we prove that we really are saved um, normally justifying this from james 2 or hebrews 11 or something like that um we can't really delve into the epistles of john too deep because we would digress from studying john 14 and i do intend to eventually address them but we we clearly have the reason given in john 13 it's that all men shall know that you are my disciples so our love for the brethren makes us known before men not before god which is perfectly consistent with James 2, where he says, what does it profit my brethren? And Romans 4, where Paul says, um, if a man have, uh, you know, if a man has, work, if, sorry, if Abraham had the works, he has glory, but not before God. Well, if it's not before God, who's left? And presumably he means men. And so uh, likewise from John's epistles, we know that we, 
are the children of God. That's the whole point of saying that. It, it, it doesn't say that it's to sustain your salvation or something like that. So again, it, it's not about whether one individual Christian is pulling his weight and doing his bit for God. It's about the children of God being able to know and identify each other and then those outside being able to identify the children of God, okay? Because, you know, if we all devour one another, well, we end up with the same mess that Christianity's already in. There's so many different denominations. How is unsaved Joe supposed to even know what's true? Because there's just so many different things going on out there. And so it's about identifying this unit, this children of God, these people that belong to God. So um, there is more that I would have liked to say on John 14. There's just so much to unpack because it's such a difficult chapter and that there's so many things being thrown against uh, faith without works you know, from this passage. But just because this study has gone on for so long, I'm going to start wrapping it up. So we are coming towards the end. There's just, there is more that I wanted to say about obeying Jesus in this context, but it, you know, it can wait until we've uh, got to John 15 and 16, which completes this same conversation anyway. So um, other things I would like to unpack about this conversation that I didn't cover sufficiently in this study, we'll probably need to cover when we get to John 15 and 16. So what, what do we do with a Christian who is stuck in sins of the flesh? Can they really be categorised as loves Jesus? Um, do we have examples of people who did not ab abide in the faith and, and disobeyed Jesus' commandments? Um, the conflicting love that Jesus, uh, sorry, that the disciples had for Jesus, which is a conflict between 14, 28 to 29 and 16, 27 to 29. Um, are works of obedience evidence that a person really is saved or, or loves God? Um, what if we don't love our uh, brethren? Uh, you know, what, what do we do with that kind of a person? And then is there an ab application to his commandments generally or, or specifically? So I would have liked to address some of these things, but, it, you know, it's already gone on for so long. Uh, and I think we just need to sort of break it up a bit more. So um, in summary, what, what, what does Jesus mean if you love me, keep my commandments? Or at least based on what we've seen and based on how John seems to define it, what, what can we understand? Well, in its immediate context, at least, it, it's got nothing to do with turning from sin. It has to do with the disciples continuing in their initial faith and, and coming to a full understanding of Jesus's relationship with the Father and following this, uh, loving one another in the absence of the physical presence of Christ and not being afraid of the persecution that may follow. Uh, Jesus is giving them an encouragement, not a warning, okay? Even though he's leaving them physically, the Holy Spirit will not leave them comfortless and they ought to love one another as equals and as brethren, united in their love around their love for Christ. John's epistles are very consistent, showing the same thing that the chief of the commandments are believing on him to be begotten of them, him, and then following this, loving others that are begotten of him. And his second epistle ties up abiding in Christ with holding on to the doctrines that he laid. Okay, so um, that's the uh, end of our study. I hope that this has uh, helped you. Uh, following this study, then, I'll be working on material for John 15, uh, particularly about the issue of abide in me. And this is normally used to teach conditional security. Um, it may take me a while to write the content just because it's took me a while to do John 14. It's a difficult passage. There's a lot to cover. There's a lot to address. And it, it takes a long time to produce carefully planned uh, content in any case, you know, with a PowerPoint and everything. So like today's study, it will probably be very long with um, lots to cover. So um, do keep your eyes peeled for that coming out soon.